Thank you. There's no microphone, is there? Oh, there's a the mic over here. So just people will be able to hear oh, Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Um, it's a pleasure for me. My name is Virginia Madueño, and I am the current chair for the California Delta Stewardship Council. And truly a pleasure to be with you. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Corey and Chris and all that contributed to making today happen. Uh, things I know like this don't happen overnight. I know that there's been a lot of planning. And for all of you who are watching this virtually and for those in person, I think that you're in for a, a really great experience and I'm really looking forward to being a part of it. Again, I'm with the Delta Stewardship Council and we are a California state agency working to ensure a reliable statewide water supply and a resilient Delta ecosystem in a way that protects and enhances the region as a place where people live, work, visit like I do, and of course, recreate. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Again, we're thrilled to have such an incredible turnout for today's hybrid event. In fact, I understand that we have about 70 people, including scientists, managers, decision makers, community members, joining us both in person and virtually. I like this little touch screen. I really like it a lot. If you're here, it's because you understand the power of relationships. If you're here, it's because you value science, you value community, and you value the notion that we go farther together. Today, you're gonna to hear a distinguished panel of discussions and featuring scientists, again, community organizations, community members, and you're gonna learn about opportunities to provide input on future restoration efforts and an ongoing environmental justice initiative, which is something very near and dear to my heart. And for those of you joining us again in person, as Corey mentioned, you're gonna have the opportunity to tour beautiful grounds here at Big Break Regional Shoreline. And you're gonna meet and greet some new and old faces. And I'm not talking like old, but we're talking <laughs> recent and older acquaintances. <laughs> I'd like to take this time to highlight some of the important ways that science has recently contributed to communities. And when I was first asked to participate in this science for communities, I thought, wow, I'm not a scientist. I was never very good at math or science. How can I contribute? But as those who organize this event, and as you hear more in the panel discussions today, you're really going to understand, especially for somebody like myself, that we do get involved and we do engage with science almost on a daily basis. Here we go. Again, Perhaps some of the most notably scientific data has helped us protect public health. For example, we all just came off of the COVID-19 pandemic, or at least the worst of it, and data has let communities know when and where cases and variants and hospitalizations are rising. California's ongoing drought data continues to let communities know what bodies of water may be contaminated by harmful algal blooms, or HABs as we know them, and of course, recent wildfires and extreme heat, air quality data lets communities know when it is safe to be outdoors. And it goes both ways. Communities support science too. For example, during the crisis, community members became citizen scientists, again, by reporting HABs or invasive species through apps and online portals. There are severe consequences of not reporting HABs and invasive species, including severe illness and economic threats. Times of need where community members sample water, quality for the state water board. And again, this is something that I really resonate very well with. Um, in my previous life, I actually worked a lot with water quality or lack thereof in the Central Valley and recognizing again how incredibly frustrating it is to see how very poor communities, rural poor communities 
were not given their due diligence, but yet these people may have not had an education, may have not had formal training, but guess what? They would go to their water taps and pour water and be able to take those to a city council meeting or a board of supervisors meeting and make their case, whether they were able to speak their language or not. And so to me, that is science, again, integrated, well integrated in the community. The, the development of state guidance documents and community members review drafts and submit, submit input. The Delta Science Community's Science Action Agenda, for example, is considered scientific questions from community members to ensure that scientific research conducted now through 2026 reflects topics most important to communities. This agenda also lets state government know where more or different research is needed. As I described on the previous slide, that research trickles down to support you as community members. By attending this workshop, you're involved in science for communities. Before I conclude, I don't know, and I've got my glasses and I still can't see here if, if uh, Diane Burgess, County Supervisor from Contra Costa County, has she made it in? Okay, well, you'll be, you'll be able to highlight for her for me. So if not, we can definitely introduce her later. I also understand that there were a couple of members uh, from representing state legislators that might be here. If you're here, raise your hand. Maybe they're, Maybe they're virtual. If you're virtual, wave. <laughs> I'll pretend to see you. <laughs> if you're here, again, we're glad you're all here, but we also are very, very fortunate to, again, welcome those that are representing our state legislators. Again, thank you for being here today. And I hope to see you at more events on the horizon for this fall and next year. You can find more information, of course, on our Delta Stewardship Council website. And with that, I will turn it back over to, who am I turning it back over to? I'm gonna turn I'm it back over to Corey. Again, thank you so much, a privilege and a pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, if you're on Twitter, uh, the hashtag Sci for Communities is the event hashtag. If you have anything you want to share, um, that will be the hashtag that uh, you can share uh, thoughts, pictures, whatever it might be. Please share nice pictures of Big Break on there. <laughs> Okay, Is everything okay with the Zoom? Yeah, so far. Okay. Uh, Zoom is not in uh, presentation mode, Chris. Okay. Oh, yes. I see. Sit on you. No, it's good. Ah, uh, looks good now, Chris. Thank you. Good. Thanks everyone for your patience for bearing through this. Okay, audio is okay too. Clear as a bell. Hello, <laughs> um, I'm Dylan Stern. I'm a program manager for the science, the Delta Science Program. It is an honor to be here today, especially going after Chair Madueno. Um, and today I just wanna talk to you about some funding opportunities um, and a little bit of uh, why the Delta Science Program is interested in science for communities. There it is. There it is. <laughs> okay. So I want to talk today about uh, the Delta Science Program briefly. 
um, why do Delta communities uh, belong in Delta science and um, science action agenda, of course, and um, then some funding opportunities that I'd like to highlight. So the Delta Science Program was established to provide scientific information and syntheses for the state of scientific knowledge on critical issues for managing the Bay Delta. And our mission is to provide the best possible unbiased scientific information to inform water and environmental decision-making in the Delta. Um, and that essentially today, I wanna to talk about how our mission is carried out through funding research. Um, and the reason why this document is not just a document and it's so important um, is because it highlights the most, the highest priority science needs um, for studying the Delta. And it was, I'll, I'll talk more about it later, but um, that's, it's the foundation for all of the funding um, that the Delta Science Program um, invests in. So, um, why do Delta communities belong in Delta science? Well, we've recognized at the Delta science program that we need a better understanding of the people who live and work and visit the Delta and um, how, how the, uh, the region impacts their health and vice versa. Um, and we want to make sure that um, we build bridges between scientists and the communities that are affected by the science. Um, and we're hoping to encourage partnerships that may form um, because, and this is the critical part, is because once those partnerships are formed, that opens up opportunities for, fund, for funding. Um, we strongly believe that community engagement can improve the performance and even make or break the success of science programs and science projects. Um, and that's because communities actually provide a way to navigate to respond to the complex social, economic, cultural, and political settings um, in which the science takes place. Local communities, um, they are experts. Citizen or community scientists can collect data um, at a scale otherwise impossible to obtain otherwise because they care about the place that they live and they have a deeper understanding of it. We hypothesize that the outcomes of community science will include building trust in the government <laughs> and in science, um, increasing scientific literacy, um, encouraging civic in engagement, improving program implementation, um, spurring learning and innovation, um, and improving the science itself. Um, so the Science Action Agenda, it's a roadmap for science that we need to pursue to inform decision-making in the Delta. And um, yeah, so it was built on a vision of integration and integration can mean a lot of different things, but it definitely means the weaving together of different forms of knowledge and we're including local community knowledge as, as a, an important part of that. Um, and then it also um, encourages collaborative planning and analysis that spans agencies and interest groups. So this was a collaboratively developed document um, that hopes to address the complexities of the Delta, the rapidly changing system, of course, limited funding and other resources. Um, and this is not just about the most important science. One of the actual um, management needs um, that's in the document really, focusing, really focuses on Delta communities. Um, and it's up here, building and integrating knowledge on social processes and behaviors of Delta communities and residents to support effective and equitable management. And then there are uh, a host of different management questions and science actions in support of that management need. And uh, we hope that there's a strong focus on those types of projects. That's what we're going for. Um, okay, so funding opportunities. This is, why, this is why I'm here. <laughs> so uh, the Delta Science Program offers a regular um, Delta Science proposal solicitation um, to fund usually several million dollars in uh, research in the Delta. Um, and of course, every scientific pro uh, project that is funded needs to be responsive to the science action agenda. The next one of those is expected in fall 2023. Um, we require every 
um, every project to have a solid communication and engagement plan, um, which, you know, it's a strategic way to encourage engagement throughout the life cycle of a, of a research project, um, hopefully shifting that engagement to earlier on in the research and not just reporting out on the outcomes after the fact. Um, we want scientists to share information as well as receive incorporate input from interested parties and community members instead of a one-way communication. Um, we, the, the Delta Science Program also oversees the Delta Science Fellows, Fellows Program, um, which provides up to two-year support for early career scientists um, to pursue biophysical and social science research on key topics also related to in the science action agenda. And they work collaboratively with academic mentors and community mentors um, to really ground their research and make it more management relevant and relevant to the communities. So um, the Delta Science Program is always looking for additional community mentors if anyone is interested. Um, and we also have a call coming up in fall 2023 for that program. Uh, we all, the Delta Science Program also um, has targeted studies um, and, and uh, I won't spend too much time on that. Um, I also wanted to highlight some other funding opportunities. Um, if you take a look at grants.ca.gov, really great resource. Um, there are several calls out right now that are actually really relevant um, to community science in the Delta. There's a regional climate collaboratives program, um, which closes tomorrow, but another round will be open next year. Um, and there's a small community drought relief program by DWR, um, Department of Water Resources, um, a climate re resilience and community access grant program, um, and several other, several other programs. So I just wanted to highlight all of these uh, potential opportunities, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, and I will pass it on to uh, the other Dylan, Dylan Chapel. Yeah, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> so again. Yes. Yeah. It's only Chris. <laughs> it's only giving us this view. Is that one maybe? <laughs> so strange. How does it look on Zoom? What are <laughs> Um, currently, we only see the in-room uh, view. We don't see the presentation view. Okay. Okay. There's at least our correct thing. But yeah. let's see. Oh, sure. Okay. We need to screen share. Again. We need to screen share again. Is that? Yeah. I guess. Hopefully. Then <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, well, we figured out some technical difficulties. Yeah. Supervisor Diane Burgess is here, and she'll briefly address you all. Thank you. Can you pop it in the yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true pleasure to introduce your county supervisor for this area, Contra Costa County Supervisor Diane Burgess who not only serves on the County Board of Supervisors, but is also a distinguished member of the Delta Protection Commission. And I'm very proud and very happy to say she will be our newest incoming Delta Stewardship Council member come January. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to Oakley. If I'd had a few min more minutes, I would have gotten on my bike and rode down here. We're right here in this neighborhood. So um, welcome to Big Break, my park, in your park. And if you haven't had a chance to walk down to the 
Delta map. Um, try to take a chance to go down there and uh, if you can't do it today, do it on another day. It's a great park. I bring my, my grandkids here. We ride our bikes. And it's really nice to kind of get to go and look out on the Delta and think about what a really beautiful place it is and all of the things that it um, supports from the, the critters and the plants to the, the different kinds of jobs that people have on the water or next to the water, the different cultures that have come as a result of be, wanting to be near the water going back hundreds of years. And so it's really exciting to be around people that value this, this place that has so much to offer. And it's, I'm really proud to have worked on different things. Roger's here, we've worked on Friends of Marsh Creek. I don't know if you guys know Friends of Marsh Creek, but we used to clean up the creeks every year and we would do restoration work. There's a fish ladder on Marsh Creek. And it was really exciting to see the work that happened, whether it was improving water quality by reducing the amount of fertilizers and pesticides that we use in our yards and decreasing the amount of water that was going down into the creek or planting better plants or non removing non-invasives. And then the, the last year that I was leaving as uh, executive director of Friends of Marsh Creek, I stood in my waders and I look really good in waders, by the way. <laughs> They're not comfortable. But um, standing in that water and watching salmon swim by. This is a creek that hadn't had a lot of um, uh, life as far as salmon goes because it had been re engineered to be very efficient for flood control in an agricultural community that you know was flooding. And, and so we've learned new things throughout the world. And so we're going to talk about science and we're talking about things that we can do to make things better, but it's all connected. It's the critters, it's the people, it's the culture, it's the economy. And so I'm really excited that you've decided to spend your time coming and hearing about the science and the, the work that people are doing. So welcome. Uh, we see it now on Zoom, Chris, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, um, Supervisor and Chair, um, and everyone who's presented so far. Um, my name is Dylan Chapel. Two Dylans back to back. A little confusing, I know. Um, I am here to just really briefly talk about an upcoming opportunity for engagement that we have um, at the uh, at the Delta Stewardship Council, um, and this is around a series of events that we are going to kick off likely early in 2023 um, that we're calling the Restoration Forum Series, and. We really need your input on scheduling this. Um, as a first tenant of making sure that these events, which really are tailored to um, bring community members together to discuss restoration futures in the Delta um, and help provide information for decision makers um, that, that helps drive sort of the next generation of projects that we have on the landscape. Um, we want to begin this process by really hearing from you all before we've even had our first meeting about when you would prefer to meet, where you would prefer to meet, um, and some of the things that you'd like to cover in future um, uh, at future events like this. So um, we have this Google form here that provides um, the space for you to provide all that. I'll have a link at the at the end of my slides here, um, and then there will be a, an announcement on the council's listserv coming out early next week that provides you with all the information you need to access that. Um, our Goals for this series are to, buy, to provide this an ongoing space to gather community input on future restoration in the Delta. Um, so uh, in 2023, we're planning to hold the first of what we envision being many conversations like this um, to provide this space over the coming years. Um, with this nexus of informing state and federal decision makers on community perspectives and needs, we've identified that this is a place that where it often breaks down. There aren't um, concerted forums to provide input at a higher level. Uh, there's often opportunities at the project level, but not necessarily at the visioning level. So we're trying to fill that gap here 
Um, and we are co-leading this effort also with the Delta Conservancy, I wanted to mention. Um, and we really see the crux of this also is building relationships between folks from different groups, um, which you can't do unless you're all sort of in the room together, uh, be that virtual or in person, although it's very nice to see so many faces in person today, um, without a space to effectively do that. Um, and just a little bit, oh, let's see, great. Um, a little bit of why this is particularly important right now um, is behind me right here. Um, this is the cover of uh, the Delta Plan, which is the document that um, guides our work at the Delta Stewardship Council uh, with, uh, with regards to achieving um, the multiple objectives that we have. Um, back in June, the council adopted an amendment to the Delta Plan that specifies um, a target for restoration of between 60 and 80,000 acres by 2050. Um, that does include some of the acreages of projects that we're already working on, but we will uh, need to be looking ahead to other opportunities in order to meet this goal. We can't do that with what's currently happening in the system. Um, and again, I think this really provides a lot of opportunity for us to start gathering that community information now um, for projects that happen in the future. Um, so I'll be around for the event today. Happy to chat with you. If you have any questions, um, uh, please feel free. Uh, my contact information is here. Uh, my email, um, that QR code will get you to the forum survey. Again, that will also be coming out on the council listserv early next week. Um, and then there's a little bit of information there about the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee, which is the interagency group um, that this work is sort of being guided by and the body that we will ultimately be informing with the information that we generate from the forums. So I don't want to take any more time. I'm really looking forward to the panels and presentations we have today. Um, and thank you all for coming. Hi, everyone. So next, we'll get into our panel discussions from our partnerships between the community-based organizations or CBOs with academic and agency scientists. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, back in the spring, Delta Stewardship Council staff surveyed local CBOs to identify various environmental and social science data issues they would like to address. And using those same surveys, we gathered the expertise and experience of scientists that wanted to be involved to work with these CBOs in this first ever event. Uh, so council staff paired the CBOs with scientists that we thought could help address the issue from the CBOs. And over the summer, these partnerships, these six partnerships met at least three times. They shared data, shared resources, knowledge, and identified gaps in the areas for these issues. And today they will be presenting their findings and we hope that the work presented today is not just a finish. It will be a jumping off point for future work, uh, maybe pursuing one of the uh, science funding opportunities Dylan mentioned earlier. And ultimately, it's something that we hope to form relationships with this event and to learn from each other and kind of tackling these important issues from a different perspective than usually we've done in the past. So first up, we have the California Indian Environmental Alliance from Sherry Norris and Anna Holder. Uh, so I'll please welcome them to the panel table over here while I set up. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. I'll, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, here. We didn't know we had it such a nice little. Okay. Fancy. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Or it's still morning. Barely. Somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, how about we'll have Sherry and then Anna introduce yourself and then your organization will set this up. And I'll bring in Steve, who is another science panelist who is attending virtually. And Priya should also be oh, on the Priya. line as well. Okay, sounds good. Okay, hi, my name is Sherry. I'm the executive director of the California Indian Environmental Alliance. Um, 
we're going to talk a little bit about it in the context of this, but our organization was formed to address mercury and fish primarily from the beginning. Um, we were set up in 2006 and we continue to work with tribes throughout the mostly central and northern California and a lot of our work did start in the Central Valley. So this is appropriate that we're here today talking about this. It works out really well. So, hello. Uh, hi all, I'm Anna Holder. I am an environmental scientist at the State Water Resources Control Board, or the State Board, and I am the, co the statewide coordinator for our um, bioaccumulation monitoring program. Okay, let me just find. Pass it to Steve. <laughs> <laughs> One sec, Steve. I think during I COVID. I can promote them on my side. Uh, he was promoted, Steve, and then here's Bria. So how about let's have Steve Blumenschein, please uh, turn your camera on and unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. There you go. With the slides up, we won't see. Let's see. How's that? You sound good. <laughs> you can turn on the slides. Is it now. is it working okay? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Oh, that's fantastic. That was so impressive. A jump into the panel like this. Um, first of all, I I want to thank Chris. It, he was fantastic in running this group and keeping everything together and on course. Is really such an impressive effort, Chris, for that, and Anna who did much of the heavy lifting and bringing all her years of knowledge here. And then Sherry, uh, learning so much from you. Okay, moving on, um, I'm Steve Blumenschein. I'm Interim Associate Director, Interim Executive Director of the CSU Water Advocacy Towards Education and Research. We call that an affinity group in the CSU system. So I network with uh, everybody around water in the CSU system, which is about 25,000 faculty and 500,000 students. So I'm charged with networking and team building among those faculty researchers, students, and administrators in our CSU system, and to make linkages among those components with the communities, exactly like events like this. And I'm also part of the California Water Quality Monitoring Council, so we have that networking as well. And Anna's seen me there, and I've seen you present. So for example, we could advance a lot of fronts and bring teams together within the CSU system and across it with these on this current topic fill some of those data gaps and needs like you'll hear about in a second. And also we have a goal in CSU Water of tribal engagement on water issues and more broadly, for example, we think there needs to be a lot of advancement in California on the relationships between water quality and human health. So we're looking to form some groups on that. And then finally, very close to our topic here where we focus on mercury and water and fish that people might eat. Uh, we found recently a big research synopsis that showed that in areas that have wildfires or forest fires, there's a lot of mercury found subsequently in surface waters and in the fish of those waters. So we're forming some teams right now to look at areas in um, that have been burned versus areas that haven't been burned in mercury contamination in those watersheds, surface waters, and potentially in fish that people might eat. So thanks. Thanks, Steve. Priya? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, join this group today. Um, my name is Priya Ganguly, and I'm a professor at California State University, Northridge, and my area of expertise is mercury biogeochemical cycling. And as Steve mentioned, um, within the CSUs, we're very interested in engaging with local communities. The CSU system is designed to support the local communities there. And my department in particular um, has instrumentation that we are interested in um, developing partnerships where essentially academics can help run samples at lower prices and our students have the opportunity to network with community leaders and find potential job opportunities and internships. Um, so I um, look forward to um, the rest of the panel and I'll go ahead and mute myself now. Is Stephen McCord able to join us as well? I don't think so. Let me double check. I think he's out of the country right now. If we can just talk about how awesome he is. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
we, uh, I think we're ready. They we'll can get through the next slide. So. Yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> so um, while CIA started working on um, on mercury and fish, we were we were voluntold to be created because at that time there were very few, uh, very little or information known about what mercury does in the human body. And as we learned that mercury um, can affect the developing fetus, uh, um, its neurological development, um, we the the conversations we had with tribal leaders was we need to get this information out to the communities right now. Like there's women that are pregnant right now eating their traditional food that don't know this. It's a right to know issue. So we gave presentations to communities um, and to the the doctors and nurses that service those communities. And I um, basically made told everybody that I refuse to give any more presentations where I tell people not to eat their traditional foods. I can't watch any more um, pregnant moms cry. Um, I just can't do it. We need to move into being proactive. Um, the other people that we worked with all agreed. So we went from there very quickly to um, working with the Central Valley Regional Water Board to create, um, uh, to move mercury into um, um, the TNDL, total maximum daily loads for mercury of all of the impaired mercury waterways in the Central Valley that we could, we could affect. Um, and the tribes wanted to have tribal beneficial uses put into those. And we're told um, by the central board, no, we can't do that. Um, it, would be, it would be too much. Um, and so we then moved it to the state. Um, at the same time, the, Fed, the federal EPA was saying, well, you do have total maximum daily loads for mercury, but there's a lot of water bodies that are impaired as actually every water body in California has some mercury impairment. We need a statewide um, water quality objective. So we worked with the tribes up and down the state to vet language for those, those two tribal, new tribal beneficial uses that right now the state water board adopted as part of their mercury statewide water quality objective. And now the regional boards are moving them back through their systems to move it into each of the regional board systems. So we're working with tribes really heavily in doing that. And in doing that, one of the things we found was of course, not just that, but in the other places, challenges. And the challenges remain you know, similar. So one of it is re research and data gap. So it, the first piece was traditional species of fish they're not necessarily the ones that the non-tribal communities are eating, like you know, largemouth bass. There's a lot of people that really like, for this perfect example, but for tribes, it's an invasive species that eats all of the, the small traditional species fish, not loving it. They don't, you know, we're not loving largemouth bass, <laughs> but there, what about the other species? So we saw how some of the tribes we work with um, were able to set up their own um, sampling for those species. And we're in, you can see in Clear Lake, they have a Clear Lake fish consumption advisory that does include um, traditional species of fish because the tribal environmental directors went out there, caught those fish, worked with the Weeha and got that, those, those fish into those advisories. So that's a really good example of, of, of tribes working with agency to get moved through those data gaps. But the other piece is, is we're not just talking about mercury, of course. Um, there's a lot of toxins that we have that we don't know what the numerical um, mathematical equations came from to arrive us at the, the objectives that we have right now. And for tribes, we really need to look at those equations to see if the community is truly protected to actually dig down into it. So the environmental directors really like more information on that. And then of course, you know, getting out there and sampling for those data sets that are incomplete so that we can actually finish those water quality objectives. So that's the first one. And in that worldview and management, so for tens of thousands of years, right, before all of us, you know, that were here, um, and I'm Osage, I'm an out-of-state person, so me included, before I was here, <laughs> we, um, the tribes in California stewarded and managed the land, I have management in quotes, because it was more of a reciprocal piece. For example, fish start in the opening of a waterway, it's time to start catching them, but we're going to wait until they get to a certain place in the river, because then we know the largest, most healthy fish got through, and now we're managing the watershed and there's ceremony attached to that. So those communities are related and they're actually working together in tandem. So that's just one example. But what, what, what tribes are looking at now when we talk about the Delta is how do we get water re sequestered back into our aquifers? How do we get the natural systems back that, that help us to clean the waterways so that the agencies don't have to be reliant on their and the technology to clean those waterways? Because in some cases they're saying we don't have the, the, uh, the science, we don't have the information on how to clean the waterway to get at all these chemicals. So the tribes are saying if it goes through the system before it hits those uh, water agencies, 
then some of that burden will be taken off of them and we'll have healthy ecosystems. So the tribes would really like to get some of those big picture management um, things that they were able to do that they were pulled from back in place. Um, so that moves, moves us to inclusion of tribal science. Uh, each of the tribes in California um, have some staff people that are working on environment in some way, shape or form. Each tribe is different. So you'll have tribes that are huge and that have big networks and some that are very small. Um, and they are, they're, uh, all the tribal organizations that work on environment have been underfunded for many, many years. So there's a capacity building that needs to move up, but also um, you'll have one person doing lots of things. So if you think about all the agencies in the state, regional, federal, um, all, every single one of those agencies that we have, the, there's someone in the tribe trying to do all of those pieces for their traditional territory and for their reservation with one person taking up the, what would be five agencies, you know? <laughs> so, um, but, they, but they're very knowledgeable and there's, there's people that have thousands of years of, of information from family members that have expertise and they may not have a degree, but they have the on the ground. So that's like talking about citizen science, it's that kind of thing, but with thousands of years of, of relatives providing information that that person has. And so, like I mentioned, they're trying to restore their ecosystems and return to traditional foods. And there's a consistent need for inclusion and for tribes to be at all of the conversations. Um, and it's very hard for those small number of people to be everywhere. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. But um, so basically that tribal beneficial use designation I was talking about is moving and we're looking at water quality objection, uh, objectives and looking at the, the, the big solutions that we're looking at and needing needing the relationships with the, the, the Western scientists so that we can come together and speak the same language to, um, to provide solutions for all of the citizens in the area. So I'll stop there and move into the rest of our science. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so my brain just stopped just then. Um, so <laughs> this summer, we, um, myself and, and the other folks that were on the title slide and that we have kind of bullets describing what we do in our work, we've had the privilege of um, sharing time with Sherry and learning from her and getting an understanding of what the needs are and, and what partnership might look like. Um, and I know that Steve and Priya, you talked a little bit about like what you do, but did you have anything you wanted to add um, in terms of what what's happening right now um, in the context of the conversations we've had um, this summer? Ongoing research, anything? Well, this, um, we have an open slate. So what I learned from being on this committee, especially from Sherry gives me directions for priorities for engagement of the CSU water community and network. We also talked about um, data gaps and uh, information that would be useful for long-term planning. So um, research related to wildfire impacts on trace metal transport and fate, um, bioaccumulation. There's a lot of unknowns with wildfires also happening more in urban areas, so contaminants that um, we don't don't associate typically with wildfires are now getting into watersheds, and also more and more coastal watersheds are starting to burn. And so, understanding the transport from land to sea of contaminants, how how wildfires are affecting the marine environment, is also a relatively new area of research. And also a lot of mining impacts also affect tribal lands. And in California, the mercury mining and gold mining have contaminated um, the entire state with that, with that metal. We also um, got an opportunity to um, speak with Stephen McCord, who um, is a consultant among, among other things. And I know has been in the mercury world for some time doing great work. Do you have anything you wanted to add about it? Yeah, yeah, McCord has a couple of tribes that I know of in particular that uh, Stephen McCord works with. I think he's still working with Yocha Dihi um, right now. Um, and so he, and he convenes a group that talks about mercury and solutions and we share um, science strategies. I don't see a lot of tribes at those meetings. Um, and I think it, a lot of it has to do with bandwidth, but, but I know that they, we send out reports that come from him and they do get them. So that's good. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. And then we, um, you know, Joe uh, wasn't able to join us today, but he was very active throughout our conversations this summer and talked to us about the monitoring that 
Fish and Wild, Cal Fish and Wildlife has been doing um, in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area and, you know, sharing lessons and information and data about that process with us. Um, now we're down to my bullet. <laughs> so um, I mentioned that I'm the, pro uh, the program coordinator for our, uh, the State Water Board um, Bioaccumulation bio Monitoring Program, which is, has been around for about 10 years. And as Sherry mentioned, the focus of our monitoring has mostly been on, on sport fish, right? And so over this past couple of years in my current role, we've really been taking a, a closer look at what we've been doing really well over these past 15 years and where are the opportunities for us to do better and the areas that need some love like tribal uh, partnership and engagement. Um, and so we're kind of undergoing that process um, region by region through something that we're calling a realignment. And um, it's a three-year process and it's really our way of figuring out, you know, we've had a lot of statements, the world has changed over the past two years. We're hearing a lot about, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and when it comes to programmatically institutionalizing and systematically operationalizing that into our work, we're exploring what that looks like for us in partnership with Sherry and many other um, tribes and community organizations in California. And just um, if you're like me two years ago and didn't realize there are close to 200 tribes in California. So it's not like we're trying to work with 10 different yeah. sovereign governments. There's two, almost 200 um, additional governments that we're trying to partner with, um, again, with different bandwidth. Just in the Sacramento Bay Delta, there's about 45 tribes that we work with. Yeah. So. Um, and so, yeah, so I will stop there and we can move to um, our shared understanding in terms of like what we've learned this year. And we didn't talk about who's going to talk through this slide, so anyone feel free to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Does either, either, have you, either of you on the phone want to talk through any of these pieces or shall we go with it? Because we, we know it too, but we, we don't want to give you a chance to be heard here. <laughs> All right, I'll start. Okay, so when part of the piece that we had to do and we're providing information with to uh, community members and to the folks that are serving them uh, for help was to really talk about how to reduce your risk, right? So we had to really understand 2003 through 2006 to really geek out and understand the science. And at that point, um, as I said earlier, there's very little known, but more information by, by working with the scientists um, and tribes and scientists and academics working together and doctors. Um, Jane Hightower wrote a, a really good book, if you've ever, on mercury, that's really good, that talks about the time period. And we had to figure out what, what species to tell people to eat. Um, and so we worked really tightly with OIHA and the fish consumption um, guidelines that are there um, ran them through a series of, of workshops where we tried to identify what we're being told, you know, like zero fish, one fish, two fish, and the, the red, yellow, and green. Is, are people able to understand that um, even if they don't speak the language and they see, happen to find it in the wrong, you know, in the wrong language for them, that it was only in English, for example, available? Could they understand it? We went through all of these processes. Um, and what, so what we do know is how PCBs and heavy metals move through the body. There's a lot of con emerging contaminants that we don't know, but we do find that mercury has a really low, you know, 0 0.001 parts per, you know, that can be in your body and have it be considered healthy. Um, there's a question as whether or not um, the umbilical cord, it's actually half of that amount. So there's still a lot for us to know um, because there might be some more uh, effects to heart later in life at a lower level than what we're considering safe right now for neurological. So there's still pieces we're trying to learn, but basically this is the best we have with some protections just in case. And you can see on the bottom left, we talked about serving sizes. So the one on the right on the bottom has a smaller piece. That's because children are more susceptible because they're still developing. So their piece of a cooked piece of fish is gonna be smaller than a, an adult. So it's just the size of thickness in the, of the palm of your hand is what a serving generally is. Um, we went through massive processes to create surveys so that for, for us, so the tribes can survey their own population to come up with what people are eating and to, at the same time to be able to provide this information. So um, the continued gaps that are there, um, I don't know if you want to go, do you want to yeah, take that I mean, part? I think you, yeah. you went over quite a few in, in your opening and I think one of the opportunities that participating in this process over the summer has given us is um, you know we're an email contact with the CSU system, right? So Steve has access to all 23 CSU campuses. We're talking with Priya about like 
figuring out, okay, which uh, research gaps or research questions are appropriate for um, students that could explore during their master's or undergraduate work. Um, and also, you know, connecting with the CSU um, and uplifting, um, you know, all the communities that we talk about when we talk about wanting to uh, advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work that we do. Um, and, you know, we, we talked, Sherry mentioned, you know, transparency around how water quality objectives and thresholds are set. I actually have a good update for you on that. We we found things. Um, and yeah, you know, the emerging pollutants that were we've probably most folks in this room, we've heard about PFAS, PFOA, microplastics. We're also interested in learning, you know, what is the nexus between um, harmful algal blooms and consumption of fish and shellfish and plants. Um, and how, you know, how do we work together when our agencies and our programs have historically been very siloed? Um, amongst each other, and then also siloed and separate from our tribal partners. Um, I think, and then, you know, this whole thing has been about developing ways to continually and consistently find ways where partnership works with Sherry and others that um, are doing all the things all the time as, as we are, many hats. Um, did I miss anything, folks, or should we move to our recommendations? We can move to recommendations. Okay. Yeah. So, um, oops, sorry. It's okay. So, one of the things to recognize is um, that working with tribes, tribes are sovereign nations, right? So, tribes aren't merely stakeholders because, you know, I'm a stakeholder because I'm from out of the area. But for tribes, they're actually governments within our the jurisdiction of the United of, of the United States, and then in California within the counties, and within you know, so tri each tribe. Um, their territory may overlap multiple regions. So you have tribes that are having to work with multiple water agencies. Um, for example, the Integrated Regional Water Management Program, there's tribes that are in five different Irwin regions. There's tribes that are in the State Water Resource Control Board regions that are within three or four of them that I've, that I've met. So they're one, that one person that's already busy is also trying to navigate all of these different places. And what happens a lot of times is we, um, when we have meetings, they'll say all stakeholders are invited and stake and tribes actually have a government to government relationship with the state of California and with the federal government and with local agencies. And um, so when they're coming to the table, the tribal leaders are representing their constituency. So they're actually nations. So there's there at the same time, you also have individuals. So the um, tribes can, are operate individual of a tribe may be operating as an individual, as an employee, as leadership. And then they, so there's, there's just a lot of nuances to that as you might have someone come to a meeting and they can't answer right now for their tribe. They've got to go back and get counsel to approve it. So the processes may, may take a little bit longer when working with tribes. Did you want to say anything about tribal sovereignty, about your experiences? Yeah, I, I mean, I think just from like a logistical perspective and in terms of developing the trust and partnership, that means when agencies and, and local and federal governments are wanting to uh, work and partner with tribes, we need to incorporate the additional time needed to develop not just the trust, but like the logistics of getting approval for things. It's not gonna happen in 30 days or 60 days. It, it might take months or years. Um, and so we need to be thinking about that as we're talking about, you know, wanting to do all of this great equity work, but if, if we can't also include those timelines and, and, and the respect in those timelines into our processes, then it's not going to work and we're just going to be at the same place we have been for hundreds of years. So when, the tri when your tribes are invited and they don't show up, it's not always because they don't care. It's often because they don't have the bandwidth. So yeah, and I think that brings us to our next yeah. bullet of including, um, you know, tribal leadership and staff and representatives and the work that we do. And I like to think about um, inclusion, as we all do, but I, I like to take it one step further and really push to belonging, where tribes know that they don't just have a seat at the table, their voice is heard, valued, important, and they feel like they're supposed to be there, not that they're there because someone needs to check a box. And getting to that place, there are hundreds of years of uh, distrust. Our collective history is not great. Right, and so really being patient and understanding that history from, you know, I am a, a white woman <laughs> from California. I had to unlearn and relearn a lot of things. And so I think, you know, thinking about that inclusion in a really intentional way into every step of everything that we do and what that looks like, not just what we think would look good and feel good, but what 
feels good and, and looks good for tribes is really important. So in this bullet of two, we talk about invite when you send out a, if you're leadership um, of an agency or organization and you're inviting, um, when you invite tribes to consult, consultation is that government to government, but there's staff that have to inform those leaders of the issue. So we're trying to say as an, as an organization, we're saying reach out to the environmental department, reach out to leadership, invite them both because they can all help. And every tribe's a little different. So and um, as leadership changes, sometimes the, the, the understanding of an issue will change as well. So the staff may stay engaged and the leadership may change or vice versa. So invite them all. Um, they're also respect those tribal community members. If the tribe's putting forward an individual as an expert, they're very, they may not have your PhD next to their name, but they re may really know the issue that, that they're being asked to come and talk to you about. Um, and tribal organizations, we're there to support the tribes. That sometimes there will be an issue like Mercury, where they're like, Sherry, we, like our organization was voluntold to start by tribes because they're like, there's nobody geeking out on Mercury and we need somebody to do that. And if you guys don't have a program to do this, it's not gonna happen because none of us really have the bandwidth right now. So there are things that they'll put on us for us to stay engaged in so that they can have their staff dedicate to other things and then they can come back to us and check in. And so we do work together. Um, and then uh, coalitions that express, and oh, so we're saying to invite all of those to any, any time that there's an environmental issue being discussed, whether it's planning, policy, development, long-term, short-term, invite them, um, provide them with documentations. If they can't attend, maybe they can provide some comments in there. But we, anytime that non-tribal science is being valued, we wanna have tribes in the room as well, because otherwise you might be missing a vital, really deep piece of information that really will help. Um, so then the third one, um, building partnerships in a culture that values and gives credit to tribal scientists, knowledge, and expertise. Do you want to stay here? Sure. I mean, you kind of segued into that. I, I think the the value piece is really important here. For a long time, um, you know, I've witnessed and, and been part of, and we've all have experiences where we're, we need information from communities or tribal governments to do our job. And so we just like ask them for it. Um, and then we don't value it in a way that that is equal to when we pay our scientific contractors to do research for us, but it's equal in its value in our work. And so from a, you know, one of the things that we're exploring at the State Water Board is how do we do that in a systematic way of really valuing tribes for everything that they're contributing for our work? Um, and yeah, do you wanna take four? Yeah, um, so allowing tribes to review final projects before distributed, that goes back to the, the piece on ha tribes having limited staff. Um, and also, you know, many of you have probably gone through processes for helping to de design a product, you know, or a plan. And there'll be the, you, you enter it in, everyone puts their pieces in, and it may have several reiterations. There are some tribes that we're going to wait towards, towards the end of your process because they don't want, they don't have time to review it a few times. So, um, and then also a lot of time, and it's happened to me before too, I don't know if any of you have had experiences where you get interviewed and they take your information and then later on you read it and go, oh, they kind of missed that. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Um, with, we're, what we're trying to do is, is document and include information about management and old uh, tribal strategies for taking care of things, for example. We want to make sure we capture them correctly. So put the time in to allow them to double check on what, on, on the data and the recommendations that tribes are giving you and if they're capturing it correctly. So tribes really want to help to interpret that data and make sure that their voices are, are being carried all the way through to make sure that the intentions behind them are captured right. Yeah, yeah I, I'm getting spidey senses that we're running low on time. Oh, we are. Okay, we're but, right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I think we've covered five and six in, in the rest of our, mm -hmm. you know, spots. But I, I, you know, I think, you know, re really recognize and understand the six real quick. Um, under, that tribes are underfunded is important in terms of how we're going to um, invite them and excite them to engage with us. Last two things are just um, tribes don't want to compete with um, NGOs and communities because tribes are nations. We'd we rather that both voices are heard, but that we don't let the tribal voice go away because there's only three openings available, for example. And then also um, tribe to tribe coordination. Tribes do need to have some internal alignment because of the way that the history has happened is tribes haven't had a chance to communicate internally as often as they would like. And also um, if the agency or someone else has to take five messages and try to figure out which ones to go for it, it would be better if the tribes could get together first and come together with the, their statements all in one block. So that's it. Yay. And from an academic perspective, I also just wanted to comment that um, 
but researchers should incorporate funding in their grants to coordinate with tribes that oftentimes if you're collecting physical samples, um, an archeologist may need to come and look through the samples and that time isn't free. That's a great add. Perfect great point, add. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm so sorry that we don't have time to have any Q and A. Sorry. Please don't. <laughs> no, don't be. Please catch them during a break or during a tour. Uh, we, we'll have Q and A's for virtual. Uh, we'll keep record of those so that Sherry, Anna, Priya, and Steve can take a look at them and uh, try to answer them later on if they wanted to. Uh, but thanks again. Let's thank them again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bria. Thanks, Steve. Also, everybody's here, Joe. Yeah, it's okay. I'll try to put them on the screen. Okay, I don't see Disha. Who do you need moved over, Chris? Oh, uh, so uh, do you see Bob online? Okay. There you go. Sorry. I got Alicia, Sasha, Anthony. Anthony. So Bob, Sasha, and then, and please, uh, you're allowed to. Uh, turn on your camera and you can unmute yourself. We'll put you all on the screen. Hopefully this. Is it, it's off, yeah, all for 40 folks. Okay, this might be a little funky with multiple screens. So maybe okay. why, yeah. okay. thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martina Kohler. Um, I am with the Delta Stewardship Council. And before we go into our second panel, I would like to um, kind of announce that we have uh, Don Notole uh, in the audience. He's back there. So thank you for joining us. He is currently also uh, one of the council members. Um, so uh, our second panel uh, is about the topic, um, is about uh, homelessness. Uh, in the region and in relation to uh, water, is water issues in the region. So we have all four panel members. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will kind of go directly. All four me panel members are virtual today with us. So I will ask them to kind of, uh, you know, provide introductions and then share their perspectives on the issue and the discussions we have had and some of the work we have done. Um, so maybe Bob, if you want to start. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Let me turn on my mic. Hi, Martina, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thanks again for, for the invitation. Um, my name is Bob Erlenbush. I'm the executive director of the Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness. Um, because time is short, I'll just cut to the chase. Basically, I mean, four different sort of justice ways to think about uh, homelessness. Obviously, homelessness is a housing justice issue. It's a civil rights issue. It's a racial justice issue, which I'll explain in a second. And also, it's an environmental justice issue, um, which I'll go into further depth. The um, Just to give you sort of the lay of, at least for Sacramento, um, homelessness in Sacramento has doubled in the last in the last three years. In 2019, there were approximately 5,000 people experiencing homelessness in our community. Now, uh, three years later, there's 10,000, um, of which 2,000, at least 2,000, and that's the Sacramento County Park Rangers estimate, at least 2,000 people uh, living on the uh, or around the American River Parkway. 
So, uh, it, so it's clearly an environmental justice issue. Um, why I said it, it's a racial justice issue as well um, is that is that uh, African American and Indigenous homeless people are overrepresented by a factor of four. Um, roughly about 13% of the Sacramento pop house population are African American for, for um, black homeless people, it's about 40%. So like I said, overrepresented re over by a factor of four. And that tends to be true across, the, uh, across California and across the, across the country as well. Um, about 85% of people experiencing homelessness are uh, either born or raised or identify um, with, with the Sacramento region. So they're not people coming from other places to, um, to be homeless. Um, a very disabled community, about 60% have at least one disability. Obviously, I'm, I'm sure most of you know that homelessness um, also um, has high rates of mental health issues and, and substance use issues as well, around 40% for both. Why I mentioned, why I said specifically um, that homelessness, not only in our community, but Los Angeles, um, uh, San Francisco, just to name a couple of communities is an environmental uh, ju uh, justice issue. I think in terms of five different components, one is access to water, which we're going to talk about. Um, another panelist, I think. Um, oh, where'd you go? <laughs> uh, Sasha's going to talk about the California right to water, and you know, ten years later, asking the question: Well, does that apply to people experiencing homelessness? Access to water is is a a really is a it's a key issue. Um, I know I thought I heard that Supervisor Natoli uh, is in the audience. I want to thank him for his leadership for even though it's a small, it's a small effort, which we hope gets bigger, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors um, allocated $150,000 to contract with a nonprofit to distribute water to people living in encampments. And I should say that that's about 7,000 people who are outside in our community. Um, through no fault of their own, due to lack of shelter uh, and lack of uh, affordable housing. In other words, 70% of the unhoused population in our community are outside, of which about more than 2,000 are along the American River Parkway. Um, a, second, a second environmental justice issue, not only access to water, but access to uh, sanitation. Um, if you go on our website, it's srcs like Sam, R-C-E-H dot O-R-G under publications. A couple of years ago, we did a survey of every bathroom in the 100, uh, 200 plus parks in, in Sacramento City, not county, but city. And we call it Dignity De Denied. Only 25% of the bathrooms were open. Um, so it's a public health crisis on the streets, not only in our community, but but communities around the country, um, the the lack of access to uh, to to sanitation. Although I think we're going to talk about it later. Um, there was sort of the urban myth that the E. coli in parts of the American River Parkway were caused by people experiencing homelessness. That's not true. Um, mostly dogs and overwhelmingly birds. Um, trash is a huge issue. Um, homeless people along the American Parkway uh, get cited all the time for littering, of which it's almost virtually impossible not to, given that there's very few tra uh, trash receptacles along the American River Parkway. Oakland, for example, has a, a model that, that every community could replicate that has a um, sanitation team, trash pickup team, um, garbage removal, et cetera, that is dedicated to, to homeless encampments. So they make the rounds just like they do for, for, for our, where we live, um, where we all live, 
um, and make the rounds and distribute um, trash bags and and pick up trash. The the other the other issue, environmental issue, is sadly becoming uh, the new normal. Uh, fires uh, along the along the American River Parkway. Um, some are caused by people experiencing homelessness. Many aren't. We had our recommendations for, for along fire safety in the encampments has fallen on deaf ears. We our recommendations have been consistently to have um, park rangers and the fire department go out to encampments, and sometimes they they have it. It's proven successful to do uh, fire safety with uh, people with the homeless encampments. Um, and the, the, last, the last issue as it relates to fires is uh, air quality. Not only do we need cooling centers and warming centers, but we need air quality centers um, for when there are uh, big fires, especially in Northern California, um, that can impact people experiencing uh, homelessness because they can't go inside. The number one health issue for homeless people, asthma. The last thing people should be is outside when you when you have um, uh, respiratory issues. So hopefully that um, gives you a sense of why the Sacramento Homeless Coalition works on environmental justice issues because it's not only a housing crisis, it's an environmental uh, justice crisis as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Sasha, do you want to? Um... Sure, hello. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's been really an honor to be part of this group um, with Bob. And I work at the Berkeley Water Center at UC Berkeley. Um, my research, my work there is kind of split between research and connecting researchers and practitioners um, around water and water justice related issues and, and long term strategic planning around water systems in the Bay Area. Um, but when this group first got together, we um, were just kind of talking over some of the issues and, and uh, raised the question, you know, how does the human right to water apply? California has a human right to water um, passed by the legislature and um, funding these safer funds that are now dedicated to uh, realizing the human right to water. So we were wondering, how does this apply in California? What are the, are there any avenues here? And so um, we just started digging through some of the documents that were publicly available, um, some of the reports, uh, the, the um, expenditure reports and the planning documents for the safer funds and the human right to water legislation. And, um, along with some other studies that had been done. And we realized we had this big Google Drive folder, you know, with all these documents in it, um, but it wasn't really easy to access or understand. So we decided to write an op-ed um, for the Sacramento Bee, which synthesized some of these issues and basically asked the question of, you know, we have this uh, human right to water in California and kind of a call to action. We need to really be uh, thinking about how this human right to water can apply to people who are homeless. And I'll leave it there and pass it to the next person. Maybe Alicia or Anthony. Yeah, so this is Alicia. Sorry, I think I joined in the wrong way to be able to turn on my camera. But um, um, so I'm Alicia Winslow. I work with the Central Valley Water Board um, where I'm the regional coordinator for the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program or SWAMP. Um, and so as Bob mentioned, um, one of the concerns for the homeless is access to sanitation, um, which has been linked to one of the studies. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, let's see if I can. All right, sorry, everyone. Hopefully now you can actually see me too. Um, <laughs> So, um, so as I was mentioning, so one of our um, studies that we've been doing is a study in the Lower American River looking at sources of fecal contamination. Um, that's a concern for recreation and other water contact activities um, since it can um, cause people to um, get sick due to pathogens in the water. Um, and I know there's a lot of public concern um, in Sacramento as well as other urban areas around the state um, that people that 
you know, living near the river and without access to sanitation um, could be contributing to that to that issue. Um, so we've just finished a four year study in the American River and working with some of the local agencies. So the stormwater partnership, the regional parks, um, as well as the um, sanitation district. Um, we don't have all of the results back, but um, with more than three years of data, um, it shows that most of the contamination seems to be coming from birds, um, a little bit coming from dogs, and but very little detections of humans, which is um, good news for the river, um, but also um, is you know important important information when we're thinking about um, impacts of people living along the river. Um, what is more of a concern, of course, is that you know those everyone near the river it has potential for exposure. So um, one of the things we talked about in our group is you know ways to get that information and data out to different you know members of the public um, and how best we can do that. Thank you, Arisha. Um, one more, Anthony. Do you want to kind of share your perspective as well? Sure. Um, I also, I don't know if I can share my video or not. Um, we just promoted you, Anthony. You can do that. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we hear you fine. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> in the office today. Um, so I, I'm an environmental scientist with the Department of Water Resources. Um, I was placed in this group, um, I think just because I work for DWR, um, I don't actually have any direct links to homelessness issues, but um, I, I really enjoyed being part of this panel. And I think that we actually did some really good work, especially with the, uh, the op-ed in the SACB, um, which did get a little bit of attention. Uh, I'm, I also live in the heart of downtown, and so a lot of, I see all of these issues firsthand, um, especially being so close to Caesar Travis Park, which is one of the only parks that I know of that has uh, a bathroom that is easy, ex easily accessible to unhoused um, people. Uh, and so I just, um, yeah, I just, I think, these issues are important, and uh, I wanted to <laughs> verify all of Bob's stats. I can definitely tell you that all of those stats sounded correct to me, um, just living downtown and seeing um, everyone that's there. Uh, and it, I feel like it's even gotten worse in the past uh, few months. I feel like the number of unhoused people has gone way up in Sacramento, uh, even uh, beyond what uh, Bob had described since I moved down last November. But I think uh, not having a connection to this type of work, I really enjoyed being part of this group because I think it's a really important uh, topic um, as we move forward as a uh, society. <laughs> These issues I think need to be addressed. Um, I also recently, um, internally, we had a environmental science workshop. Um, there are a lot of water facilities that need to be um, Need some funding for infrastructure, uh, which is even beyond um, homelessness issue, but like just a water issue in general. And so, I think unfortunately the unhoused people get the the worst parts um, or impacted the most by um, the issues that we need to fix. Um, and so, uh, hopefully that this talk or this panel um, can be a call to action to anyone out there and to um, seek out or do what you can to uh, advocate for uh, unhoused people, as well as um, if you see stuff on your local ballots to help um, towards funding towards these issues um, and hold your agencies accountable. Thank you, Anthony, that's good. Uh, so I think we have a little bit of time for any kind of interaction, I don't know, from audience or maybe we can, the panels can also ask audience questions. Um, how much time you have? Five minutes? Five minutes. Oh, yeah, can, yeah, can we bring? Are there any questions from the um, audience yeah. in person? Can you bring this? It's not a question, but just a, just a comment, if I could. 
Uh, first and foremost, thank you to all the presenters. Gee, maybe this one. Maybe I can talk a little bit louder without a van. I'm dying yeah. anyway. So. Oh, <laughs> uh, so just a comment. I just want to, again, uh, acknowledge and thank all of our panel members who spoke on this uh, very important issue. Um, in particular, I want to thank Alicia uh, for highlighting, if you will, and for Bob, the issue of the contamination in the river. And it's something that has been brought to my attention. Um, I live a block away from the Stanislaus River, and there's so many little kids, families, uh, we call them staycations because that it's called Jacob Myers Park, and it's again on the Stanislaus River. And you see so many young families, kids recreating in, in the water. And it's been highlighted uh, that there are a lot of homeless people, obviously not as many as in Sacramento, but there are you know, some, many, I guess, camps and campments of homeless people on the Stanislaus. And so as the river flows down and it goes into the uh, Jacob Myers Park area where all these kids are, that's been brought up, my God, the contamination, the fecal matter. So thank you for highlighting that, you know, we, we've got other <laughs> issues and concerns um, such as birds, um, other, other contaminants, if you will. Uh, but where can we get a copy of your report, um, Alicia? Yeah, so, um, unfortunately, like a lot of state agencies, um, our website isn't always the easiest to navigate, but um, if you search for Central Valley Swamp, um, you'll find a web page um, which has my contact information. Um, and then we do have, um, there's a link. So for the American River, we post weekly results for all of our monitoring sites on an interactive map that people can see. Um, and then we have a couple of um, PDF documents with our initial findings for that. Um, I'd also point you to um, the California Water Quality Monitoring Council has um, what's called the My Water Quality website and um, with a lot of great information on different water quality issues. Um, so one of those is the Safe to Swim portal. Um, so there is an interactive map there where you can see all the data that's available throughout the state, um, the Safe to Swim map. Um, what you will find, unfortunately, is there is not um, regular monitoring at most freshwater inland recreation areas. Um, but if that's something you're interested in working on, there is some work um, being done. And um, if you sign up for the Livers list, you can find out more on what you can do to be a part of that. So much. Yeah, thank you all very much. Um, really great perspectives. I thought it was a really good overview of a lot of the issues that we're facing. Um, and just something that, well, I was about to say, I'm not an expert, but but I hate it when people say that. So I'll just say, I am, I am not an expert and I don't know any answers, uh, but I'm curious for you who are experts, I heard, you know, from Bob, regular sanitation, um, trash pickups, for example. What other solutions do you see to, you know, I felt like I got a good sense of the problems. Where do we go next to improve the situation? I'm happy to answer it. Well, I did have uh, another recommend. Thank you for uh, your comment and question. Um, yeah, regular trash pickup, uh, and these are all short term. Obviously, um, we we need to create a lot more affordable. And when I say affordable housing, I mean truly affordable. That means that it has to be in the range of thirty per, uh, affordable to people at thirty percent of area median income. It we will not end and prevent homelessness if we continue to build. Um, even workforce housing, which is really important, but given that so many homeless people are disabled and have no or low income, it needs to be truly affordable. But in the short term, um, I still think it's really important to do uh, fire safety for, for the encampments and do that 
on a regular and widespread basis. Um, um, and uh, Sasha, jump in. Uh, we did the um, the article to get the op-ed piece. Um, it would be great if the if the California Water Board really made funding accessible uh, through the Safer Program to fund, even on a pilot project, a couple of counties, um, so they can distribute uh, water to uh, to our unhoused uh, neighbors, fund the county uh, board of supervisors who can then turn around and uh, fund programs like the Ca Sacramento Street Medicine, um, physicians and nurses uh, in training to, that go out to encampments. Those are, those are just a, a handful of ideas. Uh, need to add that we, one of the reasons that people are by the, by the uh, American River Parkway and I guess the Stanislaus as well, is that it's cooler. It, so we need, you know, um, and, and access to water, um, at least to wash off or do, you know, things like that. So we desperately need additional uh, cooling centers and warming centers with direct services. We had eight people, eight homeless uh, people die of hypothermia, froze to death last winter. These are preventable deaths. So th those are just a, a handful of, of short-term uh, solutions to uh, a very large crisis, not only in Sacramento, but around the country. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, some of the other points that we mentioned in the op-ed that Bob mentioned earlier and, and have been seen as best practices in other um, parts of the state have been having public bathrooms, that are open 24 hours a day, that are safe and attended. Um, and Bob had mentioned, you know, perhaps even having a job training program for people who have been homeless to be able to um, work as attendants, having access to drinking water at drinking water fountains available 24 hours a day and readily available. Um, and, and as Bob mentioned, you know, making sure that there is funding to enact the human right to water for all Californians, regardless of whether they live in houses or are not able to live in houses. Yeah, just to uh, expand on, on the, the bathrooms, uh, Anthony, thanks for mentioning the Cesar Chavez Park. That was two years of advocacy uh, to get a council member to place what's called a port, well, it's modeled after the Portland Loo, um, the bathrooms, public bathrooms, we need those all over town. They're virtually indestructible. They're designed by, they were designed by first responders in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and just to highlight a few things, they've got slats so law enforcement can see that there's only one person in there and not a bunch. Um, they uh, have um, uh, blue lighting instead of, um, uh, and blue lighting specifically so, if you go in to use it to shoot up, you can't see your veins. So some really um, important ideas to expand to expand the bathrooms, but it shouldn't have taken two years to get a bathroom in Cesar Chavez Park. Um, so I'll just, I'll just stop there. I do wanna add something real quick. Um, I think what we try to focus on in this group were, were things that we in our collective fields could um, have an impact on. And we did the op-ed, which we thought was kind of our best bet to actually have an impact. But obviously the best way to end homelessness is to actually house people. Um, so we really need uh, funding and policy and really a human right to housing um, to end homelessness. Uh, all of the things that we're talking about today are just answering the symptoms of homelessness not necessarily the, the root cause and so uh we need to move towards getting housing to everybody um regardless of if they have a job or not it should be a human right to housing so uh and it, it would be great it would be great uh, thanks anthony for that um it would be great if this body added uh, your voice to calling for uh, a human right to housing. Um, lots of homeless advocates. I've been doing this work for almost 40 years. Um, 
Um, so p elected officials are used to the usual suspects. What we what we need are the not usual suspects. It would really be um, quite something to have scientists and uh, your and water bodies come out and say, you know, we need not only a human right to water, but we need to couple that with a human right to housing. Yeah. Okay, I think the, this is really important. And one good thing is that the, the Council's Environmental Justice Initiative identified the homelessness as one of the key themes as well. We will be kind of gathering the recommendations. So we have lots of material today, but there will be some more. And if you could, uh, for the panelists, if you can stick around, uh, they will have um, uh, like an opportunity, uh, the EG Initiative opportunity to provide feedback, additional feedback for them this um, later in the afternoon, but also through, you know, uh, usual email communication. Uh, that that's a place to gather some of these um, these recommendations, calls for actions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Um, Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I know Vance is about to hop on. Okay. Um, Alex, will I add uh, the others? Do you want to start off, kick it off with an introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you turn my camera on? Oh. Um, there we go. We got you. Uh, yeah, well, hi, everyone. Uh, I guess you're seeing me from the chin up today. Um, so my name is Alex Gennis. I'm the uh, Deputy Director at Sustain Our Abilities. It's a nonprofit uh, focused on the intersection of climate change, health, and disability. Uh, I uh, have I live in Oakland. I've done a good amount of work in California, uh, including with organizations like the California Disability and Disaster Coalition. And just going to be here to talk about some of the intersectionalities that come with climate change, health, and disability, uh, some of the considerations uh, that you all might uh, want to take into account uh, when it comes to uh, climate change affecting the Delta and what that means for people with disabilities. Um, I will say just with regards to the last panel, there's a huge overlap uh, when it comes to homelessness and disability, uh, uh, as uh, some of the previous presenters noted. Um, a very high percentage of homeless folks um, have disabilities. It's probably a threefold uh, change versus the regular population uh, where you're going from about 12% uh, to upwards of 40%. So I think there's a lot of overlapping concerns there. Um, I am going to talk a little bit later about housing and why that's important. Um, but I just uh, want to thank the um, organizers because I think there's uh, a, a lot of, again, intersectionality. Uh, between the last uh, uh, presentation and the one today. Um, not the one today, the one right now. Um, I'm also looking at Stephen, and I'm distracted uh, by trying to uh, uh, juggle here with the moderator. So um, yeah, do you want to hop in? I know you're going to uh, do that here. I don't know where Vance is, but I know he'll be on soon. Um, yeah, sure. I can go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Elser. I'm a senior environmental scientist working in the adaptive management unit of the Delta Science Program. My work is especially focused on climate adaptation strategies to address our restoration targets and the challenges brought on by drought. Before this position, though, I did my PhD at Arizona State University, where I worked as a part of a research network that brought together interdisciplinary scientists with local practitioners in the cities across the U.S. and Latin America to co-produce strategies to help cities become more resilient to extreme weather events brought on by climate change. Uh, so that's sort of the 
the expertise that I'm bringing to this panel to talk about resilience uh, at a more broad level. And I'm really excited to, uh, to be here today and to learn and to be a part of this event. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, Eric, if you see Vance join, will you go ahead and add him? Um, but for now, I'm gonna get started with some of the questions that we prepared. Um, Alex, can you start us off by, can you uh, describe the disability community, its diversity, and uh, the various ways of approaching disability? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there's Vance. Um, I think should Vance, Vance, you to introduce yourself. We just we just went through this. Yeah. Hey, thanks everyone. I appreciate. It. I was trying to get on. I couldn't get on. Uh, and then I got on. I couldn't turn on my video or my mic. Uh, depending on what I have to say, or if you like this shirt, maybe you didn't want me to turn on my video or my mic. Huh? <laughs> no, no, I like the shirt. <laughs> All right, thumbs up. We're at it too. We're we're in a good spot. But so by way of background, I'm Vance Taylor. I'm the chief for the Office of Access and Functional Needs at, not done yet, the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, which is probably, if you're keeping track, the longest out of any title in state government. <laughs> but I always say, I don't know that it's a competition, but if it was, I would be winning. <laughs> so, um, I don't know how much you want me to do beyond that or, 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 or not. I'm happy to talk about what we do or just wait and answer questions. Uh, I think that's great, Vance. Um, Alex was just about to answer a question describing the disability community, its uh, diversity and different ways we could think about approaching. Awesome. And if you could just, by way of practice, any of the hard questions, make sure they go to Alex. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I guess I'm taking the hard question right now because that is a uh, really very complex question. Um, you know, with uh, when it comes to disability, uh, there's a couple of different ways of approaching disability. Um, uh, the first one is the medical model of disability, and actually, I know we're going to touch on this in another uh, another section. But basically, the medical model says. Uh, uh, you know, it's flawed. Uh, it says that able-bodiedness is normal. Um, and it says that any kind of difference from this able-bodied norm uh, is a uh, 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 kind of a problem that needs to be addressed, and we need to use the medical system to try to bring people with disabilities back uh, to kind of able-bodied status. So um, that's the medical model of disability. The social model of disability says that um, uh, functional uh, limitations and independent living limitations and then other uh, issues are uh, based on a lack of inclusive design uh, supports um, and uh, kind of mentality uh, concepts in society, uh, discriminatory attitudes, right? Um, so if you can imagine how uh, that might interact with specific types of say medical conditions um, that someone uh, with paralysis such as myself I have a medical condition that makes it so that I can't walk, and there's other things associated with that. Uh, but uh, the disabling factor for me, uh, let's say to get to a second floor of a building, would be if that building doesn't have a ramp um, or an elevator for me to get up there. I'm disabled not because I can't walk upstairs, but I'm disabled because there isn't a ramp or an elevator. So that's kind of the two main ways to approach disability. Um, the diversity of the community, uh, you know, uh, usually in government uh, reports and the rest of it gets broken down into a few different categories, such as uh, mobility, disability, um, uh, visual impairment, uh, being hard of hearing or deaf, um, independent living disability, chronic uh, health conditions, and a few others. Um, and then there uh, are intersectional factors where uh, two people with identical disabilities who are um, in different uh, otherwise socioeconomic categories, the person uh, who is in the more oppressed or marginalized group will probably have uh, more kind of functional limitations within society. There's going to be uh, more, more chips stacked against them. So uh, that's kind of the way that we approach disability. Um, uh, it's uh, an issue where, um, and then there are overlapping disabilities uh, as well. 
Um, so I'll just say it's a diverse group. It is uh, um, technically, if you look at the numbers uh, that the census uses, which are flawed the way that they look at disability, but it's about 12.7% uh, of the overall population, I believe. Um, a lot of uh, disability advocates and experts will say that the population is closer to 15 or 20%. Um, so it's a pretty significant community. Um, and uh, here in California and the United States with an aging population, that's going to be, uh, 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 you know, increased levels of disability as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, the next question we had was to uh, talk about what are some of the important um, health concerns related to climate change uh, for California, especially in the Delta, where we expect to see um, worsening air quality from wildfires, uh, potentially uh, higher extreme heat events as well as um, floods. And so uh, maybe I can pass this off to, uh, to Vance to answer some thoughts about uh, how we might consider actions to take in relation to those. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think one of the factors that we have to think about is just the, the fact that, you know, with climate change being what it is, that it really does pose as this existential threat, right, in that what we're seeing isn't just an increase in the number of disasters that we face. It's that we're seeing an increase in our scope and scale associated with the devastation caused by those disasters. And of course, we know that individuals with access and functional needs are disproportionately impacted. And so when you look even, you know, just within the last couple of weeks, we've dealt with an extreme heat event, but at the same time that we were dealing with that extreme heat event, we were dealing with grid reliability issues and we were dealing with fires. And we were dealing with uh, you know, air quality index issues. And we were also dealing with a tropical storm coming up in Southern California. All at the same time, within the context of, of, of COVID, right? Which has not gone away. Um, and so when we look at the health impacts, we see that, yeah, it, that there's health impacts at every turn. And if we're not engaging the whole community in the way that we plan, prepare, respond to, and recover from those disasters, then ultimately we put people in positions where they're not gonna be able to have life-saving information or services or assets and resources provided in ways that enable them to maintain their independence and their health and their safety. And I would say dignity as well. Um, we can't look at healthcare as, is somebody sick or not? We have to look more holistically and take a step back and recognize that health is impacted by much more than illness or injury, right? Health is very much a, a, a real part of our ability to tackle things like climate and come up with adaptation and mitigation strategies. And it's also a very real part of our ability to do inclusive uh, integrated planning with individuals who have lived experience with things like disability, as opposed to the historical approach, which was to plan for people with disabilities, not with them. Um, so, you know, it's it's a lot of bites to take at that apple, but ultimately, all those bites lead to a shift that I believe results in better health outcomes for all individuals, particularly those at highest risk. Yeah. And, um... If I can jump in, the you know the the actual impact of climate on someone with a disability is going to be um, you know looking at that looking at the climate impact, considering the person's kind of acute health, almost you know the, the public health term, the uh, touchy in the disability community, but would be health related vulnerability, 
uh, to that climate impact. Um, so some people with disabilities have a harder time with thermoregulation, um, which would make it so that when there's a he extreme heat event, uh, if you put them and an able-bodied person outside at the same time, they're more likely to have a health complication. Um, but then uh, if they are homeless at the same time, there must, I mean, they they either will, they don't have housing with air conditioning compared to an able-bodied person um, who uh, is less likely to be homeless and then uh, is more likely to have an air-conditioned home, right? Um, and might not need to go to a cooling shelter. So there, there's there's the intersection there as well. Um, but yeah, what Vance mentioned, air quality issues um, and uh, extreme heat events. Um, and uh, I'd say those are probably the two biggest uh, health-related uh, kind of exacerbating issues in the Delta. So there were others that came in. I don't know when y'all were talking about water quality issues too. and. The rest. So, yeah, thank you, Alex. I want to follow up with you because you know we talked a little bit now about some of the um, health-related issues, and I think somewhat of a, a medical model, but there's also the social model that you brought up earlier. I'm curious if you have thoughts on how we can integrate some of our thinking around um, climate adaptation using the social model of disability. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, let's just go back to my example of homelessness, right? Um, the social model of disability would say that um, a homeless person who has a disability um, is more likely to be low income because of discriminatory factors in society. Uh, they are less likely to have access, you know, discriminatory factors and then kind of uh, uh, um, lack of accommodations um, uh, and the rest uh, when it comes to society. Um, they are uh, um, less likely to have access to, uh, you know, housing in general, obviously, shelter uh, when in the case of an emergency, um, uh, their own vehicle for evacuation in the case of, say, a heavy flood event. Um, they, uh, um, so there's a few different things there. Um, my brain just, my brain occasionally will will stop in the middle of kind of assembling these paragraphs uh, as I speak, but um, you know, uh, so when we're looking at how to address that using the social model, what you'll say is ways to reduce the disproportionate impact of climate change would be to, uh, first of all, remove discriminatory attitudes, um, educate uh, stakeholders that are involved in climate response, uh, as we're doing here today, um, uh, to uh, make for more inclusive planning, uh, certainly addressing the housing issue. Um, creating uh, more accessible housing. Um, and I'll say from my side as having worked on uh, extremely below market rate units are incredibly important for the disability community or just below market rate units in general because of disproportionately low income. Um, even market rate stuff will over the course of its lifetime remain accessible and eventually become relatively cheaper. Um, so, you know, even in that respect, and then um, for uh, there, there are people with disabilities that are uh, able to afford market rate apartments and housing. So those are just, that's kind of picking up one example, right? Uh, looking at housing heat waves and then housing with quality windows will insulate somebody from uh, poor air quality. The list kind of goes on. Um, I wish that I had an overarching answer. The tricky thing is that when you're looking at climate disability, you can break climate down into a million things. You can break disability down, not into as many things, but for each of those factors, you draw a line between them. You look at the line, you say, what social uh, factors of disability? Um, what are the social determinants of disability here? And then what kind of policy interventions, community actions, uh, public education, um, and changing discriminatory attitudes can reduce that um, a social contributor uh, to disability. So um, that was, I should have done the process first and then given the example. But, yeah. Thank you, Alex. I, I think one thing you brought up that's kind of uh, a commonality is a lot of these models have, you know, they're simplifying and there's a kind of underlying um, complexity there that always makes it difficult to uh, connect. Um, 
precisely, you know, there's always exceptions, I guess, if you will. Uh, this made me think a little bit about one of the common uh, climate adaptation phrases that we throw around, which is resilience and the idea of how do we build resilient communities. Um, I think, Stephen, I don't know if you would like to hop in here, but um, can you talk a little bit about the concept of resilience and some of the, the uh, ways that we can approach that or think about that with um, in the space of climate adaptation and uh, some of the work or thinking you've done? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, when I consider resilience, I think about it through a social, ecological, technological systems lens. And I would define the term very broadly as just the capacity of a system to absorb or withstand some perturbation, perturbation excuse me, such that the system persists and maintains its major structures and functions. So resilient systems, can, they can self-organize, they can learn, and they can adapt. Uh, one thing that I want to point out about resilience is that it is not necessarily a good thing. Resilience uh, is not a normative concept, although it's often colloquially described or discussed in terms of it being a positive thing. But just as a concept, it's really just a property of a system. Whether something is good or bad is a values question, and values aren't really built into the resilience concept. And highly undesirable systems are often highly resilient. Authoritarian dictatorships, for example, are highly resilient, but they're also violent and oppressive and many other terrible things. So I want to be clear about that, that resilience is neither good nor bad, and increasing resilience in a way that is positive for one community may come at the expense of another community. So I mentioned that I approach resilience through a social, ecological, technological systems lens, and I want to explain what I mean by that and the benefit of this lens for addressing resilience issues. So this lens explicitly acknowledges that the systems in which we live and work are made up of people and nature and built infrastructure, and that these three domains are constantly interacting with each other. And by understanding the connections between those three domains, I think that we can be more holistic about our resilience approaches. So I'll give a quick example of a benefit to taking this approach. Uh, since we're talking about heat, let's say our goal is to increase the resilience of a city to heat. One strategy that many cities might take to address that goal is to plant more trees, which makes sense because trees, they provide shade, they cool down the local environment. And while that's true, some trees can also make air quality worse, which can create issues for communities that have respiratory issues. Some trees have roots that will grow quite close to the surface of the soil, which can cause damage to built infrastructure like sidewalks, which can hurt communities who have mobility issues. So by applying a social, ecological, technological systems lens, we can better understand and acknowledge uh, and anticipate the effect that an ecological strategy like that might have on the built infrastructure, on people's health, and how we can design our spaces to be more inclusive. So while planting more trees might increase resilience of a city to heat on average, it might also reduce resilience in some ways for certain communities if you don't explicitly consider the needs of each community and understand the interconnectedness of those different domains. And, and that leads me to my final point, which is I think we need to be very explicit when it comes to pursuing resilience. And if you only remember one thing I say today, I hope that it's this part. Uh, so for me, when I think about resilience, I ask myself three questions. So resilience of what, to what, and for whom. And that for whom part is really where the rubber meets the road because resilience is not the same for all communities. And by painting with too broad a brush, uh, we may reinforce unjust and undesirable resilient systems. So it's also, I would say, a benefit for scientists and project managers alike to be explicit about resilience because it helps to define what exactly the goal is and what metrics we might need to keep track of to understand whether or not we're actually uh, successful at hitting our resilience goals. Uh, and so I think by doing those things, we can work together to achieve more, more positive and, and verdant futures. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you, Stephen. So we have uh, only two minutes left. And so I want to give uh, a chance for, I see a hand up for an audience question. So um, we'll do it. We'll take one audience question here. I was interested in, um, yeah, what am I, I'm sorry, I'm talking to this, oh, okay. Um, I was interested in the discussion on flood for um, the disabled community because there's two things, and it kind of dovetails with what Bob was talking about on the last panel. You have, while you're working on your infrastructure solutions, you really need to develop a messaging system 
that really will um, alert um, disabled people if there is a flood threat, an imminent flood threat, and that really successfully reaches them. Uh, because, you know, in the parts of the urban delta, we have massive communities that don't even understand they live next to water, even though they're behind a levee. So that's, um, I think that can be done with, through signage in communities, but I think there's a technological answer to a lot of this that's way beyond me. Um, the second kind of part to that question is in the interior delta, you also have a, a really significantly elderly population. The average age in parts of the delta is 57 years old. So, um, you know, I think you also have to build in what's that response how do you get that messaging out for protection to um, the elderly? I, I, I would think agencies are equipped at doing this because of heat situations. But then we kind of fail at that because we always hear about the people who don't make it through a heat wave. So I, I'm, I'm struggling with how do you do that in, the, in, in an interior of the Delta in a place that doesn't even have great Wi-Fi uh, or really great communication systems? Uh, I'll, I'll make a really quick point is um, I think we all really should care about development patterns. You were talking about communities that aren't aware that they're next to floodplains. And this is another social issue to consider is uh, because of the costs in our cities and often more climate resilient areas, uh, temperature wise, at least I'm thinking of Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, um, because of the costs there, um, uh, people with disabilities and then seniors and low income individuals have increasingly been pushed into more um, really environmentally precarious areas sometimes, um, being in floodplains or at the urban wildland interface. So this is just a, a very large structural uh, influencer on um, uh, people being in greater danger. I know, Vance, you've done, I mean, really good stuff about communications and outreach, though, um, in your time. Yeah, I think part of what we have to do is meet people where they are, right? So, you know, are we going to alert? Yeah, we're going to alert. We're going to alert on news stations. We're going to alert on press conferences. We're going to push out uh, you know, uh, alert, warning, emergency notification messages on email, on text. Uh, we're going to do phone calls. But we also have to work through community-based organizations that serve these uh, you know, individuals that are at higher risk, right? We have to work through our trusted partners. The, the, the fact is, is that there is uh, a personal preparedness component. There's also a government component, but there's also a very, very big component for community-based organizations and also private sector partners. And you can't over alert you can't over-inform, um, but in order to ensure that water gets to the end of the row, you need for all of these partners to be working closely and coordinating closely with one another in recognition that this is much bigger than any one of us, right? No one organization, agency, state government, private sector, or community-based group can do it on their own. When we talk about things like the whole community, it's because it requires the whole community. I always say that when it comes to things like health and emergency management, we're either going to fail or we're going to succeed, but we're going to do it together. Yeah, I, I want I want to build a little bit on that as well. I, I think doing it together, I think, is 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 so important, and the social connections that we form in our communities. So part of the way of trying to get alerts out uh, beyond you know through text, through through radio or whatever. I, I think another important point is just having social connections and trusting people that know to look out for you and to reach out to make sure that you are aware that a threat is coming. And so that's true of flood. It's also true of heat. So for example, social isolation is one of the largest or the best explanatory factors um, with regard to heat uh, mortality, at least in, in the Phoenix area where I did a fair amount of heat 
uh, research. So I think just those social connections are so important for um, building resilience to a variety of extreme weather events. Thank you, Stephen. I think we are at our time limit. Um, I'm going to uh, bring up um, Morgan to introduce uh, our environmental justice work. I will say right after she goes, we're also going to have our, if you're in person, a tour um, of the Big Break site. Um, and if you are online, you'll be able to engage with some of the environmental justice uh, um, opportunities um, through the chat, connect with Chelsea. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Um, well, Corey's getting it started, I'll just say. Hi, I'm happy to be here. I'm Morgan Chow, as Corey mentioned. Um, I'm a senior planner at the Delta Stewardship Council, and um, I'm going to share a little bit about our environmental justice work. Um, and then hopefully we can talk more and get um, additional feedback from this group on um, Delta-wide EJ issues that we've heard about over the last year or so. Um, and I'm the last thing staying between you and the break, so I will be brief. So as many of you um, in this room probably already know, the state of California has been making, um, I'll just say EJ from here on out, um, a priority over the last few decades. Um, and really trying to work it into principles, um, policies, planning, and funding priorities. And in more recent years, um, a lot of the state agencies that we at the council work with um, have developed EJ policies, principles, or guidelines. And um, the council is now working on its own um, effort to identify and build a better understanding of the EJ issues facing the Delta and surrounding areas and approaches that. Um, we at the council can take to improve the EJ landscape. So just to clarify what we mean by EJ, um, California was also one of the first states to codify EJ in statute in 1999. Um, and under state law, the definition is the fair treatment of people of all races, cultures, and incomes with respect to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, but the movement really arose in, bigger than that, it um, arose in response to the disproportionate share of environmental impacts such as pollution, um, land, air, water contamination, um, other hazards borne by certain communities, um, particularly low-income communities of color. And the concept over time has broadened to not just include the distribution of impacts, but also um, represent representation and inclusion in planning processes that affect how those um, impacts and benefits are distributed. So these are the three main components. Um, so the first is referred to as recognition or representational. So that's how um, impacted communities are represented in decision-making. Um, procedural or process is more how planning processes and decision-making um, is or isn't fair, transparent, accessible, um, and whether or not it provides opportunities for communities to participate. And then lastly, just distri distribution or distributive. So um, how the environmental benefits or impacts are distributed equitable or not and or mitigated so that no one community bears a disproportionate burden. So really the objectives of our work are to one, build a network of community leaders and organizations to inform and support our EJ work moving forward, um, to identify environmental justice issues that are impacting communities in the Delta and surrounding areas. And then lastly, to identify options to address those issues. And what we've done over the past year and a half um, is first to build a panel of EJ organizations um, to serve as our EJ expert group, as we're calling them. Um, and I'm super happy that all four of the organizations are represented in today's event. Um, we've also done pretty thorough background work, um, reviewing reports, literature, other agencies work in the space 
Um, we've spent the last six months interviewing community organizations, um, just over 20. Um, and I'll just note that all of the community organizations participating in today's workshop were identified through those interviews um, and a question on really like, what are your science needs? So that's also, we're also excited about that. Um, we spent a lot of time going through public comments that the council has received um, related to EJ over the last 10 years. And now we're attending a handful of community workshops to get additional input um, on top of what we've already heard. So this is the first of, of a fall series. And then I'll just share what we've heard so far. Um, we've heard a very wide reaching and interrelated set of issues, um, including issues on representation, um, issues on fair process and issues on like, physical in, um, impacts on the landscape. And we've grouped them um, according to, so those larger color circles are like our eight main issue areas. Um, so climate change, flooding, water, recreation, and outdoor access, tribes and indigenous justice, food security, um, housing and homelessness, and pollution and public health. Um, so those overarching topics, they're very broad. They include many more specific issues, um, some of which you can see are in gray in this like network map. Um, and they're all very interrelated to one another as um, speakers have already mentioned today. So our next steps are to continue to gather ideas from community groups um, to see how we can just like further define and make improvements on what we've heard so far. So last slide. Um, to provide us feedback, um, we have made some space today and then we're happy to chat more. We would love to chat more afterwards, but we have a booth in the back room um, where you can basically add a sticky note or several um, to our brainstorming board. Um, we'll also have more, more information over there on just like the detailed information that we heard from the interviews we conducted. We'll have information on um, some local upcoming events and just um, information around voting and taking action. Um, for those of you that are joining virtually, we have a mural board, which is just basically a virtual sticky board. Um, and our staff, Chelsea Batavia, will be helping guide you through how to put input on that board. Um, and lastly, if anyone's interested in reading our full interview results, um, we can definitely send you a copy. Um, and it's actually also linked on our website. So there's also food and refreshments by our booth. So. Definitely get some, it's been a long afternoon, but thanks for the time. Thanks everybody. We'll go on to our break. We'll have five minutes. So we'll meet back uh, for the tour, the big break tour right outside. Why it would be taking us around. You can check out the cool Delta map that Supervisor Burgess mentioned earlier. Uh, so we'll meet outside the tour at 5.15. Uh, and please check out the Environmental Justice Input Board in the back and with coffee, tea provided by Big Break and some snacks. Thank you. Yes. Maybe they can be back by 540. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was going to put the thing. Yeah. I was going to say that. Thanks. thanks. Uh, Chris, would you like me to pause the recording now? Sure. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, should I start again? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Spencer Fern. I am the science coordinator with Restore the Delta, and I want to say a huge thank you for Chris and the team over at Dia, the Delta Science Program for setting up this workshop. I feel like it's been very informational. And um, I kind of want to pass it on to Karen and Meredith to introduce themselves, and then we'll take it from there. All right. I'm Karen Atkins, I'm over at the Central Valley Water Board, and I am part of the FPAB program, Freshwater and Estuary Harmful Algae Bloom Program. And I'm Meredith Howard, I'm at the Central Valley Water Board, and I oversee our planning section programs, which are our basin planning program, our uh, total maximum daily load program, and of course our Delta program. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of wanted to start off by saying that this presentation is gonna mostly be on harmful algal blooms. And uh, it's kind of a discussion on data, resources, and then uh, a, another topic on educational outreach. And so 
First thing I want to do is explain who Restore the Delta is. And uh, we are a nonprofit port organization that focuses on Delta related issues. And those issues range from flooding, uh, water quality, salinity intrusion, uh, along with many, many other types of topics, at least in how they impact communities uh, in, initially or in the same vicinity as these issues. And a lot of the work I'm going to focus on is obviously, as a science coordinator, the science side of the organization. But RTD has also been that organization that has stand up, stood up for community and agency meetings and among many other types of situations like that. And so obviously, the, I feel like as a presentation on harmful algal blooms, I should explain what all harmful algal blooms are, which a lot of you saw on the tour out there, it was, at least it was mentioned once or twice. But um, HABs are often made up of cyanobacteria that can release toxins into the water column, column through under right conditions. And those conditions can vary from temperature to water stagnation, which is just water staying in its same spot, uh, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, light availability, and many other impacts that can kind of tie into the same thing that causes these benefits or these uh, situations that help cause harmful algal blooms. And these blooms, uh, when they release toxins, can have very many health and ecological problems, like illnesses in humans, which can range from liver to uh, cardiac arrest, depending on the strain of um, bloom that is in the water. And then there is also illness and death in pets and wildlife. And specifically in pets, it would be dogs and cats ingesting water. And um, obviously that is the toxin being ingested by a body like that will essentially kill it. And then um, fish in fish kills, which happen from the harmful algal blooms after they have produced and bloomed they take up dissolved oxygen in the water, which kills off fish. And a lot of you might've seen reports from at least Lake Merritt and how those blooms caused issues in the fish in, or the impact there. And I think I, one thing I should explain why RTD is so interested in harmful algal blooms is because we, as at, at least when working with the State Water Control Board with Karen and Meredith, we were focused on filling in those data gaps. And I know that's been a topic that's been recurring throughout a lot of the panels today in these data gaps, and especially in Stockton, people could report it, but there wasn't much um, monitoring followed up. So we kind of wanted to fill in those gaps. We tested around seven sites, and I'll go a little further in depth on that in the later slide. But uh, we kind of wanted to test those areas and find ways to you know, fill those gaps and then hopefully get more uh, exposure to those types of issues we see on the Delta on an everyday basis. But um, the goals for this uh, presentation were to make or to like talk on topics about making the data accessible for the public, and then also brainstorming ideas on how to educate youth, which I think would help when we in, in, uh, inform the public. And so, the first topic of being making data available that we just grabbed this summer more accessible for the public. Um, I want to say that we monitored, like I mentioned earlier, we monitored seven sites around Stockton, and in, um, we measured for specific cyanotoxin of um, microcystis. And uh, we used the Abraxas strip tests, which were a recreational one. And I just wanna make a, a statement of recreational is more so for people who enjoy the water and not people who drink it. And uh, when I go further into the uh, advisories, which I think you touch a little bit on too about the, um, the signs, but um, we sent a lot of, a lot of our data, the, the strip tests we used would test up to 10 micrograms per liter. And I'm going to keep that number highlighted, at least in your minds, while I go into the next section, because we would send our samples off to UC Santa Cruz once uh, from each of the seven sites once each month. And that would confirm what we saw, whether and they would use liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, quite a mouthful, I know. But um, it's slow. It, and that was for them to kind of confirm what we tested with our test strips. And so doing so would help find a way to confirm what we're seeing on the ground. And obviously, there's limitations to our test strips in, a, in an initial standpoint. And so, as you can see on this, this uh, advisory and the warnings and the, the signs here, kind of going to walk you through all of the, the stages. And so these are trigger levels, again, for uh, recreational use, not for uh, domestic use. And uh, there, obviously, a no advisory is a 0 to 8.8 .8 microgram per liter. And that just means that the, there aren't toxins enough in the water to cause alarm. And I just want to point out that Stockton has never once in my entire testing time with any test we had ever went below 0 
So I would say at least for the caution tier, which is going to be 0.8 micrograms, and actually let me explain what the, or let me get there first, uh, the 0.8 grams to point or to six micrograms per liter, that is going to be the caution tier. And this is a tier where uh, we've seen a lot of these signs around Stockton, especially. Um, but the the thing about this one is you you can still swim in the water if it's there. You just need to avoid bloom act, or if you see blooms, you need to avoid that. You still you could still fish. You could still you could still do most things like stand around the shore. But it is still it's like a concern, and you want to make sure that when you're in that area, you're still like watching out for pets and animals going into the water. And that's going to kind of hold true through the rest of the ones. But uh, the warning tier, which goes from six micrograms to 20 micrograms per liter. And the reason I want to bring back up the 10 micrograms per liter is that is the limit of our test. So we can't test further than that, except for what we send out to UC Santa Cruz, which is unfortunately only a once a month endeavor. But um, in this one, in this stage, you'll see that people can't swim. Um, and this time it's just no swimming at all, because obviously a bloom is a little too pronounced. Uh, you're never entirely sure how where the toxins are being increased. And somebody even mentioned it before on the tour that uh, they, they saw bloom activity, but they didn't see the toxins. But that doesn't mean that the toxins wouldn't get into the water and how that mechanism works. And um, in that tier, that's you could still fish. And obviously, you, you just have to fish. You have to clean out the guts. But when we get into the danger tier, uh, which is 20 gram micrograms per liter or higher, uh, that's when we get into an issue of uh, actual concern for the community. And you want people to either, whether get into the, uh, the media outreach, you want to make sure people aren't even staying near the shoreline because at this point, no fishing, you don't know how many of the toxins can get into the fish. And then obviously people who eat the fish will get toxins that way. And it's a big concern. And so with that, I'm going to move into the monitoring sites and then I'm going to explain the map a little bit, but, um, we, I want to say the one thing we saw, at least when we were monitoring and collecting data in the Stockton area, was that the downtown area of Stockton was hit the most with bloom activity. And for the whole month of August, every week we went out to McLeod Lake, which is this site right here. If you can see it on the map there, I know that's kind of hard to see which ones are tied to which, but each of these dots points into a spot of the map where we were testing from. McLeod Lake, which is right in that downtown area, as well as Mormon Slough and um, Morelli Park, were all points in which these blooms were exact or like a lot bigger. And the test results, at least for August, were uh, breaking our test limits each and every week. And um, out of the other six testing sites, like I mentioned, Mormon Slough, Morelli Park, Smith Canal also had a um, harmful algal or had a bloom in the month of May, which through a little bit of early of June. And I'll kind of explain why I think that was the first bloom we saw in Stockton. But um, other than that, Windmill Cove, Buckley Cove, and San Joaquin River, if you can see on the map, they're kind of on the farther left side. Um, those three sites, we never saw bloom activity, but I want to say that the reason for that was because it was a little more of an open channel where water was flowing a little more easily. And so water temperatures, what we were testing steadily increased out of throughout the entire testing period. And while the data is preliminary, I really believe that the temperature uh, put a lot more of an effort or an instance of why these blooms were showing up. And so all sites except for Smith Canal, uh, and I'll explain why not Smith Canal, ranged from the high 60s in Fahrenheit to the low 80s by the end of our testing period. And those 80s were during like the hottest parts of, of our summer in the Stockton and Obviously, if, uh, well, not obviously, water holds its heat. Water holds its heat because of its capacity to uh, transfer heat into the atmosphere and vice versa. And so the hot temperature, and especially where Smith Canal, because Smith Canal was in the high, or it was in the mid 70s when we first started testing. And I want to say that the reason why is because, at least on this map here, you can kind of see Smith Canal and the dot doesn't really line up with it, but it's this spot right here, is right next to a park. And it's, Water empties into this spot where it just sits there and it, there's really no movement and it's got a light bl blaring down on it, which, and it, it's pretty low in depth. So it just heats up. And I, it was always pretty much the hottest spot that we would test all throughout the testing period. And so obviously I feel like that's the reason why that area got hit with a bloom first. And that's kind of concerning because it's next to people living there. There's houses there, there's a park and a bunch of people just that go and fish there. Now, 
don't know how many people were fishing and eating, but I hope it was minimal. But uh, I kind of want to go into how we want to distribute our message, and we're still working on other aspects. But uh, that map on the previous slide was through a program we call Water Reporter, and that's where I've been inputting all of our data, and eventually that map will be on our website. But um, that map, if you click on the points, I'm going to go back real quick and take a look at it. If you click on either of the Windmill Cove, Buckley Cove, whatever it happens to be, um, you can. it's an interactive map. Um, you can see the, the trend lines, because we'll we care, we, we, rather, we grabbed like data that ranged from water temperature to salinity, electroconductivity, air temperature, wind, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of factors we put in there just to see if there was a trend among certain things. And so um, a lot of that will be on that. And once it's on there, it'll be available for everybody to see. And um, that's, that's the Water Reporter app, which we're still working with. And I'm still tweaking some of the data because sometimes when you input data, it doesn't fully show up, but we're working on that. But um, and I feel like another aspect of, of social media being a way to tr spread our message is also very important. And um, we're sort of the Delta has been periodically releasing videos. And I want to give a shout out to, I know Cynthia's in the room, uh, but also some of our other interns like Gloria have, have been taking videos of us while we're out and testing and putting them on our, our Instagram or Facebook or Twitter as ways to like explain it to people. And uh, feel like it's been great because the amount of people that ask me in the field what that green stuff is on the top of the water, it's nice to point them to a resource to at least see. And so I kind of want to show you guys two videos that we took, at least through our social media campaign. First one's going to be about um, like our testing sites and what it looks like in an average day when we go out and test for water. And then the second one's going to kind of explain that Abraxas strip test that we took. And I'm just going to play those real quick. Hopefully that is fine. So yeah, that was the first one where we were just kind of going through it all. And then this one kind of explains like what we were using those test strips for. And that first video showed out McLeod Lake where you could kind of see some of the, the floating green algae and the... Uh... Interpreting Microsystems Sample Collection. Putting in an Abraxas strip, I'll switch it to this cartridge that I've already pre-labeled as our 17th week sample. And, uh, if I'm judging this right, it's probably going to come up really negative, so it's going to make a nice little sound right now. Yep, it is. It's, it's recognizing a line on the left, but no line on the right, which means it's the exact limit of the test, and it's at 10 parts per billion. And so, as you can see on the strip itself, there's only one line. For going by the, the guide here for how to interpret it using it with just eyes, you see that the no result here is 10 parts per billion. The limit of this test, that's as far as it can go. So, McLeod Lake down in downtown Stockton has been like this for about three weeks now. Just shows that the toxins are in the water and not in the, the blooms anymore. So, something to be concerned about and something to recognize as an issue in Stockton. So, that's pretty much like two videos we had on our it's social media, or on our social media, but we're trying to focus on finding more ways to get this message out. And obviously, it starts with that. Okay. Interpreting Microsystems Sample. Okay, hang on. There we go. Okay, so in the second goal of this um, of this workshop was to find ways to obviously educate the youth about HABs issues in the Delta, and I feel like that also kind of ties into the public outreach. But um, the importance of informing the public, I feel, starts with the with the youth. And given that we share data that's publicly accessible, it's another aspect of making it so that people understand what we put out. And so I feel like. It's, it's a goal to get it into the hands of children and kids who are growing up around Delta communities, whether that be Walnut Grove, here in Antioch and Contra Costa, uh, Stockton and other, other sites and other spots like that. It all ties together in this idea that, you know, when, when we're kids, we kind of latch onto things. And I can tell you from my own experience, uh, I learned about the missions in fourth grade, and I can tell you that it has had no bearing on where I went in my future. But I feel like 
if we if we had some sort of lesson plan as we were growing up and you know obviously people are a little more interested in what they can see in their own backyard um getting this incorporated into lesson plans for elementary school high school and even college to an extent which i'll kind of go in on uh would be really helpful for getting at least the kids to talk to their parents about what they see like say if somebody's having a barbecue at the at the park over right by smith canal and uh their kids see a bunch of the bloom activity and so that that's really toxic and it it, it it opens the conversation for everybody and at least in a way that makes it so that people can learn about it and so what i what i mean by like at least for elementary and high school i feel like it would be impactful to get into a lesson plan and either our earth science or life science because it's kind of a bit of both uh course as we're going through elementary school um but in high school and college at least at least the colleges in the areas of of the delta like for instance like UOP in Stockton Delta College in Stockton also um UC Merced's been had a proclivity for finding interest in these uh water quality conditions in in the Stockton Delta and the Delta as a whole I feel like it's it's important to at least get the conversation started because I can tell you from my own experience I didn't learn about blooms until my third year of college so considering I used to go to high school right in downtown Stockton where I used to run up and down a stretch where blooms are at McLeod Lake I used to run up and down that stretch and didn't know about it until now it's kind of concerning but um in that in that realm of getting it in true information on the kids um there was this article that was shared during one of our meetings that was a are you a hab warrior kind of an article that show it's like geared towards kids so that people like kids when they're when they're given the information that it's like a nice little infographic and it's got pictures in there and i feel like this is something we could kind of incorporate into the school work but um obviously we need to do some work in brainstorming and getting those ways to get them into lesson plans for schools and obviously getting that to go in there there's a lot of work to do it but something like this feels like it could work but um with that i'm going to pass it over to Karen and Meredith for the Central Valley's opinion on this <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah so as the Central Valley Water Board we have a role in all of these things and we have a role in trying to get information out to folks about harmful algae blooms so in general the program that i work on which is a freshwater and estuarine harmful algae blue pro bloom program has a couple main themes and one of them is trying to get information out to folks about harmful algae blooms. We're also interested in when and where harmful algae blooms are occurring and how to collect data to really answer the questions that we have around blooms and also to keep people safe. So that all kind of goes with that message of trying to get um folks information. So we have some resources to try to educate folks but a lot of them are online so and definitely focused at adults so we have this page that you can see here it has a lot of amazing resources that are very helpful for folks some of you probably have seen it um we have guides of how to identify algae we have um how to keep safe information but and we also have this uh little wanted to do a shout out here for reporting a bloom right there on our webpage um and when you do report a bloom we have a whole team of folks who will follow up with you we'll work with age local agencies to get signage out we have veterinarians who can work with you if you have a um a pet who was ill we have folks from fish and wildlife who can come out if there's a fish kill and then we also have doctors who will work with people um so so we do do a lot of follow up um and then that would go to our map which those little dots up there correspond to the signs that um was were covered previously and that's our really main way of telling folks what the state looks like in terms of habs at any point in time. So this isn't particularly child friendly I wouldn't say and it's not really targeted towards that audience. Um we also have off offline sources that we try to reach people with the signage and then also we have pamphlets that we uh put in the entryways entryways to parks um and that we pass out in various workshops um and those can help folks too but we have uh agreed and we're going to we're going to partner with uh Restore the Delta this winter hopefully hopefully <laughs> um to get some kid friendly materials worked up and um come up with some lesson plans so that's a very exciting development from this workshop yeah so i guess we'll take questions i don't know if we're still doing that chris so. uh, i think yeah we might be running short okay okay, okay. Anyway, feel free to email us <laughs> 
Jaron and Spencer. And Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Um, Chris, there is a question in the Q&A section from Barbara Wolf. Well, uh, maybe we could try to answer it afterwards. Um, I think oh, we're trying to Yes, check out that map. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> yes, check out that map, says Mary. Well, we could uh, invite uh, your panel to as I try to do this. Oh, no, no. So we'll invite the next panel, Will, Christina, and Anitra. Um, he's gonna uh good evening everybody thank you for joining us um for our panel on um science uh, connecting climate resiliency and public health through community engagement i'm going to hand it over to will here who is going to introduce everybody. Yeah, so good evening, everybody. Um, are these working? I just want to make sure, or not. Yeah. Okay, sorry, just wanted to make sure. So good evening, everybody. My name is William Mutzenberg. I am the Program Manager of Public Health Advocates, and I will be leading to uh, this panel, uh, along with my colleagues over here, uh, Anitra Pali and Christina Green. Uh, is David on uh, Zoom at all, or is he here? Hi. No, okay, just want to make sure. So. With that, uh, I'll go ahead and allow us to uh, do our uh, introductions really quick. So um, my work at Public Health Advocates, I'm the program manager for the Transformative Climate Communities Program, also known as TCC, or uh, in the case of Stockton, Stockton Rising. And so at TCC, we uh, our main focus is to connect community members with uh, certain services and uh, resources that will help enable them to be climate resilient, which I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, with that, I'll be, go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Christina Green. Um, hi, everyone. I am a research scientist with CLEMAS, which is a um, the research organization funded through NOAA. And uh, we do a lot of work on engaged research with different communities in the Southwest on climate adaptation, climate vulnerability, and resilience. A lot of the research I've done has been on what I call human dimensions of drought and how drought has affected specifically rural and farm worker communities in the Central Valley. And then I'll pass it over to Dr. Anitra Pali. Thanks. Um, I'm, my name is Anitra Pali, and I work with Department of Water Resources. But in the past, I, I did actually environmental education. And so there's some intersection here, the, the previous work I did ages ago. And so I've always been a big advocate of, um, you know, the cross section between, you know, the sort of social dimension and the and the science dimension from which I've more, more recently come. And most of my research or, and work, really work, is just been getting a couple of large restoration projects on the ground in the Delta, which is um, much harder than I ever expected. And it's <laughs> taken a fair number of years of my past, of my recent life and, uh, so that's kind of what I've been doing, but there is that that desire to have that sort of floodplain uh, restoration science sort of intersect with um, the human dimension. And then the last person uh, on our panel that I, I'll mention is David Maldoff. Uh, he's not on to, uh, the line tonight, but I'll go ahead and just read his uh, his bio just really quickly. So he's an environmental support manager at the Divi uh, flood management division of the Department of Water Resources. He has over 10 years of environmental experience in, uh, in water resource fields, and his current work consists primarily of ensuring environmental compliance with uh, various regulations and ad advising interagency on uh, flood risk reduction, restoration, and multi-benefit projects throughout the Central Valley. So with that, um, I'll kind of dive into a little bit of the background of why, how I ended up here and uh, the work that we have been working, uh, that we have been doing. So I just want to share a little bit more about the Transformative Climate Communities Program. It, uh, in 2020, the city of Stockton received the TCC grant from the California Strategic Growth Council. 
And is there? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to lose this thing. You go. Okay. And uh, so the focus of, as I mentioned earlier, the focus of the grant is to connect residents within, uh, as you can see on the map, that service area with resources and services to address climate change. And so what our focus is mainly is climate resiliency and making sure that these communities are able to weather the impact, whether it's uh, whether it is extreme heat, access to energy appliance, uh, appliances, and uh, urban greening and tree canopies, amongst many other things. And so we want to make sure that these households are reducing their greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas footprints, while at the same time making sure that they're economically resilient. And so many of these communities, uh, which I'll uh, share in a little bit, uh, are extremely disadvantaged and have long been disadvantaged, uh, both by the city of Stockton and by the state of California. And so some of the nonprofits that are formed TCC include Public Health Advocates, where I'm from, but as well as Little Manila, who you'll be, I believe, hearing in a little bit, as well as the Catholic Charities Diocese of Stockton, Edible School Yard Project, Rising Sun Center for Opportunity, and of course, the city of Stockton. Hold on. All right, so why was this uh, specific community selected? And so this community was selected because of uh, the many census tracts that this uh, Cal and virus screening scores. 12 of those uh, communities are located within this uh, South Stockton community. And this community has many disadvantaged uh, residents who are people of color, low income, and are oftentimes seen as the first to go on chopping blocks when it comes to uh, many different uh, uh, urban renewal projects and the like. Um, I believe I'll share an uh, example in a little bit. And so many of these residents don't have high school education, much less, much less college education. Uh, the average household income is around $33,000, which is barely enough to sustain a large uh, family, much less yourself. Many of these communities also uh, are disadvantaged because they have high rates of asthma and cardiovascular diseases. And so many of their hospital visits are related to this, which is in turn impacted by uh, the, the amount of pollution that these communities have been having to deal with over the last century or so uh, uh, in Stockton. And so while the uh, major component of TCC is to connect residents to these services, one major component is community engagement. And that's where public health advocates comes in. And so we wanna make sure that these communities that have been long neg neglected have some sort of buy-in into the work that we are doing. We don't wanna just come into these communities and tell them, hey, you need to do this and you need to do that but show them why it's important to get these services and make them feel empowered in uh, receiving these services and how they can translate that into advocacy for their communities. And so one example that I wanted to bring up uh, very vividly because um, in addition to the algal blooms that you're seeing, uh, one of the biggest changes that we've seen in Stockton is how communities are transformed by redlining and being seen as blight. And so in Little Manila during, uh, one, the example I wanted to showcase is the Little Manila neighborhood which before the uh, 1970s was a very vibrant Filipino community made up mostly of immigrant farm workers. And so these people came from the Philippines to work on fields, uh, or work in the agriculture sector. They most likely um, did not speak English well. And so, uh, and probably uh, as we're seen by the, uh, by the longstanding white community members who had political power, uh, seen for a, a good target for removal. And so during the 1960s, land was taken away from them uh, in order to build the Crosstown Freeway. And I'm sure our, my colleagues at Little Manila who are here like uh, Myla and Mac can definitely share more if you're interested on the history of this urban renewal project that the city of Stockton decided to go through along with the California Transportation Department. And so they effectively created this freeway which now acts as a full segregation, uh, a segregation barrier between North Stockton, which is more affluent and South Stockton, which has communities, like I said, which are in the 95th percentile of various uh, diseases. And so uh, these communities, you know, they see trucks going through their communities, but they don't get to reap the benefits of these trucking routes that get to tra uh, transport goods. In fact, many of these communities in South Stockton lack access to fresh food, vegetables, clean air. And so this is an important example of how without full community engagement, uh, government agencies are allowed to just go through, destroy communities to create what they see as urban renewal without actually consulting the communities who are disadvantaged by these. And so through TCC, Public Health Advocates is really focusing on directly connecting with residents uh, by recruiting community members who are participating in our governance structure, educating trusted liaisons and who are gonna report to their neighbors about these TCC operations and pro uh, projects, and then bringing residents together to directly connect them with our uh, service partners. 
But to me, I see it as more than just engaging communities. It's about empowering their vo uh, empowering community members to use their voice. And so by uh, empowering their voices, it instills a sense of belonging, uh, desire to invest, and fosters community bonds, which in turn leads to sustainability in the long term. So how do we want to get the community to use their voice? And so that's where our panel came in today. Uh, in preparing for today's panel, we kind of focused on crafting a survey so that we can get a sense of what are the environmental issues that are most pressing for South Stockton residents? How have they been impacted by climate change uh, and climate hazards? And from there, what would they like to see in addition to the TCC work that we're doing now? What other opportunities do we have to advocate to either city leaders, county leaders, or state representatives to make an impact that's gonna shore up resiliency even more? Because I don't, while I, you know, I'm a strong believer of the TCC work that we're doing, I don't think it's enough to mid or unravel the decades, if not centuries of disinvestment that this community has seen uh, in South Stockton. And so we began with identifying a purpose. So what did we want to do with the data that's being collected? And, for, and since we're the lead advocating organization, we, uh, I wanted to focus mainly on how do we advocate on the issues that the community identifies as most pressing? Because there's so many issues out there that we could say from just a, as an outsider perspective, this is what the community probably needs the most. But we won't know until we actually go in and ask the community themselves. And I'm sure there's many other, there's, uh, I know that there's tons of survey work that's going out there. And I don't wanna say that our work is, the work that we wanna do with the survey is to mitigate those efforts, but to work in conjunction so that we can have a strong unified uh, front to work with our uh, governmental agencies and partners to create policies that are gonna have a positive impact for our communities. From there, we kind of focused on what uh, data that we wanted to gather. Was there a need to collect demographic data? How does this correlate with environmental questions being asked? Uh, and then do we look at the awareness of the issues and how it impacts community members? And so not only do we want to just analyze what the community knows, but determine what appetite do they have uh, in both learning about climate issues and moving uh, and addressing these climate issues. And so what do they feel is the best way to engage them? And what actors should be involved? And how should, what actions should be taken? And so through our work, uh, working together, we came up with a, uh, sur uh, 30, a roughly 30 question survey that we hope to go into the community and begin gathering this data. So I won't bore you with all of the questions, but I just wanted to highlight them here as I talk so you have a chance to kind of read them and potentially answer them yourself, you know, in your head. But we kind of wanted to start with the demographic questions, because I think that's a really important key point, is that every individual is going to see climate change through a different lens. And not all answers are going to be the same. But what we want to gather from this is where do we have opportunities to really direct resources and engagement? Because a household may be full of young people and they may have different needs and wants and policy than uh, older folks. Latino communities may have a different need from Asian communities, different from black communities. And so knowing where all these different uh, groups see climate change can help us when we do our engagement work to know what is your community looking for and how we can better strengthen our relationship with those communities on these particular issues. And so knowing where are we talking, who, who's our audience, and how do we engage them on the issues that matter to them? Because if a community just says, we don't like this and we want to focus on this, but we come in and say, well, actually, no, we want to talk to you about this other issue you didn't say was your priority, then we're not making any inroads. We're not making any strides. And so we want to make sure that we're focusing on who, are, who is our audience and how can we in the future be able to interact with them. Second, we, kind of, we, ask individ, we want to ask individual, individuals how have they been impacted by climate hazards? Because I, I think there's a lot of talk about how, what climate issues are important, but how have people been directly impacted? Have they been impacted by heat, climate heat or these extreme heat patterns that we've been seeing? Have they noticed that these heat patterns have been increasing? Or maybe they just don't notice at all. And so that's also an important thing to recognize is maybe communities haven't been paying attention and they're just now realizing, oh my, you know, extreme heat is an important issue for me. And so that's kind of where we got, went with all these different uh, questions is we wanted to focus on heat, wa uh, water quality, air quality, uh, urban greening. And uh, this is not a full extensive list. We definitely want to go back and make sure uh, before we go out into the community that we really want these to be our solid questions. So there may be other uh, issue, climate issues that may come up. And then lastly, we wanted to ask about agency. And so how do we connect with residents and what do they want to see from either the different actors or who do they want to see as the main actor leading these issues? As I mentioned before, Caltrans and the city of Stockton said, go ahead, bulldoze through this community. Let's build this freeway without any agency. And so they may not trust 
the city of Stockton or the state government to come in and make the right decision. But they may trust community partners. But again, we won't know until we actually communicate with them and gather certain data points so that we can say, you know, these are your trusted persons or these are the agencies or the actors who can lead in, uh, in addressing climate resiliency. And so we wanna see where, what uh, agencies folks wanna see actions coming from and what kind of actions would they like to see. And that will also help us in terms of what do they know and where are opportunities to both educate and engage them. And so in conclusion, our aim is to collect data uh, in the coming months. Like I said, we still need to finalize and finish this survey. And our plan is to roll out the surveys physically to community partners, uh, yeah, to our community partners and having an online platform in which to engage residents with. And because of PHA's longstanding history of working within these communities, we hope that we'll be able to collect that feedback that we're looking for and help determine how the communities have been impacted and what actions they wanna see. PHA is definitely a strong driver, a believer in a community-based approach and learning from and listening to the communities that we are working with to advance policies. And so by collecting this data, we wanna shore up resiliency in the long, uh, long disadvantaged communities and empower the residents to use their voices to direct policy-making decisions uh, for themselves and their communities. And so with that, I'll open it up to Q&A. So unfortunately, we won't have- uh, Just I'm kidding, no q &A. Huh? Is there, uh, Was there? Yeah, okay. Like you wanna, Two there, minutes, okay. Is there any question uh, or anything you wanna add, Christina or Anitra? No. <laughs> I just quick comment and not just about this, but I've just been so impressed with the work that's been done by everyone here. It is very hard to get people from different, um, not just even from different disciplines, but from different organizations to work together. Like it took us a while, several meetings to just kind of come together and find a common vocabulary and a common way to see the problem. So um, I really applaud everyone here. Thank you. Is there a question? Yeah, we'll just throw one question to the audience. If not, we can also move to the next panel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, is there a question? Oh, that's, that was in my PowerPoint slide. That was it. Because I thought we were going to have a QA section. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank, well, thank you. you. We were over here about uh, is, uh, is that even a question? Okay. Thank you. I think you're We have one more panel. I want to even look at it. Yeah, turn, I'll turn on the lights. Yeah, I'll stand here. I'll find it. I'm not breathing on anybody. Did you just turn it off? Did you just turn it off? Did you just turn it off? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't. Are you on the panel? Can I send it to you? Yeah. It's okay. I don't have one for you, but I'll let you know. Yeah. Oh, how about you? I don't know if this is connected to anything. Uh, uh, it's okay. Maybe I can Yeah, that, that's Yeah. Is this online? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It is online, but I wonder if there's a way we can log in. Yeah. We do see it. We do see it on uh, the Zoom. Uh, so. Yeah, we just need to display. It's okay. I, I got this. Let's see. What is it? We're on a, we're on a PC. It's not showing on here, but Matt, Myla? Yep. Yeah, thanks so much. So my name is Matt Holmes. I'm the Environmental Justice Director for Little Manila Rising. We're a nonprofit in South Stockton. We were originally created to be a historic preservation organization. Uh, a couple of our, a couple of South Stockton residents had to go away to college to realize that they're a part of a historic community. They got all the way through high school and nobody told them, hey, you're from a place that matters. They had to go to UCLA. They had to go to San Francisco State. And they learned about themselves and they were grateful for that. 
they were already they were also pretty pissed off that nobody had bothered to tell them that while they got out of high school. Told them about George Washington and Paul Revere and all that stuff that's not true and doesn't relate to them. But didn't tell them that their dad really mattered or that their neighborhood did stuff for America that we that we yet to acknowledge and take care of for them. So they came home and wanted to restore. They found historic structures being demolished, being torn down to McDonald's and all sorts of things. They worked real hard to try to save those buildings. They intervened in that process. They got some attention from some smart people and they kind of slowed the process down. City helped designate a historic site and said, yeah, we're gonna help you guys. And they were already shaking hands with the demolition experts on the other side. So they you know, double crossed Little Manila. We realized we didn't really have a friend in government. And so we realized we need to work on a culture shift. And so we spent a lot of time working on education reform while still pushing forward the historic preservation agenda. And a couple of things happened over that time. You know, worked hard to make sure that nobody gets out of high school in Stockton without knowing about their own people and their own people's experience in Stockton and made ethnic studies a, requ a required curriculum for students in Stockton, which was great. Um, didn't relate to the governments and the governments didn't help us do this. They, they fought us at every turn and they, we finally walked away, but the kids caught on, they dug in their heels and they demanded to have this curriculum reform instituted. So it became policy for the entire school district. Well, and then you run into a scenario where, so I just pushed you through high school. I taught you a bunch of stuff that's relevant to you. How are you gonna get into UC? You're gonna take a white privilege test called the SAT and the ACT and you're not gonna place as well as white cultural students who take who take a test that's designed for them. So we're the litigants that pursued UC Regents to dismiss the SAT and ACT and that's why it's been discharged. Uh, so we're really proud about that. Happened during the pandemic, we haven't celebrated it enough. Um, but the, the idea behind education reform was we really needed to have a community that, that understood its history and valued itself. And I want to stress that like Little Manila was just one neighborhood on the Oriental side of town, right? There was a Japan town, there was a Chinatown, there was Barrio del Chivo, a Latinx neighborhood. There was Boggs Track, a black war worker neighborhood. None of these communities have been acknowledged. They don't have a footprint on the map and they don't have a dedicated preservation org or a social justice org. So we started to realize that there's a whole host of us marginalized communities um, that, that, that really haven't been served by our city. And as you heard Spencer say earlier, the south third of the city has got about 80,000 to 90,000 people living on $32,000 a year. And so quickly realized that, you know, education reform and historic preservation are great, but it's really gross to save a building while people are dying outside. And so started looking into public health equity and really hit the throttle on that when three years ago, our founder and executive director died of an asthma attack um, from a disease that was planned for her, from planned pollution, from permits given to people in a neighborhood that was already overburdened. Um, you, can't treat, you can't get rid of asthma, you can only prevent it. And when somebody keeps permitting emission sources in your neighborhood, uh, they're doing that to you. And they're able to do that to communities because we're not always at the table. You know, we're not there, when, we, you know, when you work three jobs, you don't have time to show up at the planning commission and intervene in the process. So I'm gonna walk you through a few quick slides to tell you a little bit about how we got hit with history and how we started to learn about environmental issues. But we would not be here if it wasn't for Restore the Delta and Barbara Berg and Perea. Um, they've been providing our environmental justice trainings for years now. Uh, they read me in on, you know, the Delta scenario. I, you know, I worked in Richmond for 15 years on air quality and parks access. Uh, job training, and I wasn't ready for Stockton. Stockton's a deep story. I'm still learning a lot about it. But my first, you know, assignment with Barbara was to learn about your climate vulnerability assessment. And, uh, you know, it was shocking. It's really a terrifying assessment, especially the disproportionate impacts in San Joaquin County. Uh, and I was pleased through that process that we were talking early with a state agency, that we were given a chance to surface that report with our community. And that, you know, when I said things like, if we have a disproportionate risk, we should have a disproportionate adaptation funding. And that's what equity looks like. You fund people who are in the most trouble. And so nobody pushed back on that process. So uh, when Barbara said, let's work with this Delta Stewardship Council, I said, all right, we can, let's try to capture an agency before somebody else does. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk some people into equity and environmental justice. So I was pleased to join the equity issue paper. Um, this, uh, I, I'm sorry, Myla, I should have introduced you first. Myla's our new conservation education director. Uh, she's actually a wetland restoration ecologist by training. She's from South Stockton. She knows way more about this stuff than I do. Um, I'm really just a history worker who uh, finds himself pushing agencies and environmental issues through memory 
Uh, and my memory around all these issues is that they're tied to white power and white violence and the inequality that ruins really all of our good ideas. You heard from the access people earlier about uh, uh, accessibility. Um, it's hard to build anything when nobody's got a house, right? We've competed people out of basic shelter. We've competed people out of basic dignity. It makes it really hard to do anything above that. So uh, maybe we have an economic system that doesn't serve us off. But let me orient you to some of our some of our beautiful pictures and some of our sad story, and then I'll jump into a presentation for the two panelists drop out. Uh, but I think I'm going to carry them because they, they both had really great ideas and they both fit under a framework of climate resilience means different things to different people. We can plan giant infrastructure projects and plan for a thousand years. Uh, but that doesn't acknowledge the fact that not all communities are starting at the same place. And some of us need urgent intervention now. And maybe that doesn't always fit into your cost benefit analysis, but it's worth doing because displaced people, injured people and dead people uh, deserve your respect and care. It's also expensive to do though. So if your preschool teacher didn't reach you, reach you about fairness, I hope your college economics professor did. Um, so I just wanna show these pictures about, so we have a, a crazy redlining story, which you're all familiar with. And I see a show of hands, everybody's heard of redlining, great. Uh, anybody heard about the Homestead Act? You know, we gave 10% of California to whites only and they have disproportionate rights because of that. We perpetuate that with state policies. People play dumb about it. It's a categorical fact. Uh, anybody know about the alien land law? Yeah, so we passed laws because we brought in, we, we recruited so many people from Asia to do work we weren't willing to do. Uh, we were worried they would, they would put, it, put down roots. So we really tried to uh, divest them from the wealth making strategy that works in America, which is land ownership. And so that's what really led to this vibrant community of Filipinos in South Stockton who, because they couldn't own a home, they would build cooperative housing units like single room occupancy like Elks Lodges um, and uh, you know, really didn't live there all year, right? This is a migratory farm worker population that did agriculture in the Valley, canning all the way up to Alaska. Um, but they had one place to come home and that was Stockton. It was, it was the largest community of Filipinos outside of the Philippines. And for a while, uh, little paper envelopes from a restaurant from, from the Resolve Club was the, the largest source of, growth, of uh, income for the Filipino government, built every freeway, hospital, school that trained the population that came here later during Vietnam. So uh, Stockton's a globally significant city. Um, but you can see the Crosstown Freeway here that you heard about earlier from Spencer. A uh, great example of a situation you're about to be in as an agency. Uh, just like redlining was a, a brutal response to maybe a good idea from the federal government that said, let's help everybody buy houses. Uh, local racists use that opportunity to skew benefits and skew burdens. Uh, and they hurt real people real bad with uh, messing with the housing policy. Same deal with transportation all over California. Uh, local governments use transportation construction dollars to destroy and displace communities of color. The most racist architecture in California are freeways. And so you can see just a, in, a, in a better resolution, you can see uh, scores of buildings have been totally demolished for a freeway that was urgent. We need it now. We need to, we need to get trucks to the port. The port of Stockton needs logistics support. And so they didn't finish the freeway for 30 years, right? So, I mean, you know, these, these are not interpretive flourishes of Matt to call these things racist. We have scores of comments about people saying, please don't demolish our neighborhood. And then we have a small number of you know, influential people saying, we're gonna put the freeway through the middle of our city. We're gonna cut off our nose despite our face, even their preferred routes outside of town. And I mean, honestly, this is probably what depressed the economic futures of Stockton for decades. Um, so consequences, um, you know, so uh, real quick, this is, the, this is the slide we like to use. Progress is not in quotes. They really thought tearing down historic structures for a gas station and a, and a McDonald's uh, was progress. Uh, it's painfully ironic because we, we lost history to a freeway and to you know, fast food. Uh, commercial charbroiling and grilling is 26% of our particulate matter pollution in South Stockton. Uh, oil and gas production has really sort of ruined the Central Valley's political structure, but it's also a source of local air pollution heavy duty trucks, heavy duty diesel. They distribute from this freeway that was eventually finished across this community. Uh, 
that has an overburdening of stationary sources, but also a spectacular level, like a nation leading level of mobile source pollution uh, that has been normalized. That everybody in our neighborhood thinks asthma is like allergies. Everybody gets to have their life shortened. Um, you know, we have 13 year advanced mortality rates in some census tracts. And this is in accounting with it as um, the 100th percentile for asthma incidences, but no public health department program for asthma. So this historic preservation organization, just as Restore the Deltas had to step in and talk seriously about the Bay Delta plan and water quality because no local agencies in Stockton are taking it seriously, or Restore the Delta has to call them up and say, Habs are in exceedance, you guys got to put up the signs. You know, Contra Costa County does that, the East Bay Regional Parks does that. Our neighborhood doesn't do that. So we live in really different Californias. Uh, we have to operate uh, an asthma intervention program. We have to take over and build a local air monitoring project. We have to do an accountability project for all of our government. And then we assess those governments and we determine who has captured them. And we very clearly map how benefits have captured agencies to stop doing their job and stop providing equal protection to California residents. So it's a sad fairness story, um, but at least we know our history. We know what's going on. We know who's in the room. And so our goals now are to build allies across the state and across Stockton and to uh, see if we can recruit anybody else, particularly white people and white cultural institutions to do better and stop playing dumb about this history. Because we're not all guilty about historic racism until we play dumb about it and we double down on it and we pretend like it doesn't exist. Uh, because the wealth inequality that comes from all that is, uh, is a threat to everybody. And that's what come, brings us to the, the climate vulnerability assessment that you guys got from, that you guys gave us. And I wanna, I wanna pivot to that. And then we can do some Q and A later. Oh, did I close it? Where am I? Oh yeah, that's one. Thank you. Because what I wanted to talk about was um, uh, climate resilience planning what that means for different communities. 10 minutes, I'll be really quick. So uh, Jim Jacobs was my former landlord. Oh. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. This was really weird. I saw Jim Jacobs on an invite to a planning meeting for this. And I thought, oh man, I added one of my contacts to a meeting. It's got nothing to do with it. I thought it was like a total clerical error, but I don't even know how Jim got into this story. But he was my landlord in Richmond for like 10 years. And, and Jim is, you know, we always describe him as the scientist that knows everything about the oceans. I would like lecture on, you know, climate issues on cruise ships and sea ice. And so he described himself as a PhD student because he's going back to get another degree. Uh, if that guy doesn't have 30 degrees already, I'd be shocked. Uh, but Jim is passionate about protecting communities from global climate instability. And that's why we connected early on. And in Richmond, we would see inequitable issues around flooding and sea level rise. Um, I used to work for Rosie the Riveter World War II home for National Historical Park, and we would be inundated in that visitor center routinely by hydrostatic buildup from sea level rise, particularly around king tides. So um, Jim started schooling me on ways that communities can know about floods and ways that governments aren't assessing flood risk accurately. You know, we see a lot of folks in the Bay Area, and I always joke, uh, San Francisco will get a seawall or get one real fast, but over here in Richmond, we'll be stacking sandbags. Uh, and I remember feeling really left out when I was in Richmond. And now I'm in Stockton, I wish I had Richmond's problems. Right? <laughs> Things roll downhill in California, and I'm really glad I'm not an Arvin and Lamont shaft or two. So it's all, it's all structural. There's a history to all of those inequalities. And you know, Jim, to his credit, saw that there was something unfair about how we were responding to climate change. And while I was building remote sensor networks for air quality to provide early warning services for communities during refinery meltdowns or uh, traffic jams or particularly around wildfires because um, our governments didn't know how to handle that, right? They, they said, we don't know that school's safe. It's smoky at school. Uh, we, we aren't sure that we can cover you with our liability. So walk home in the smoke, which is worse than in this building to a building that has no info no filtration services, because uh, we're going to cover our ass and your permanently damaged genetic material isn't in our insurance policy. So they made those kids walk home. So I started to catch on real fast that we didn't have a lot of friends in a sacrifice population, but Jim was one of them. And so I want to talk about his strategy about um, preparing right now 
for sea level rise, particularly around stormwater events uh, and ways in which government agencies aren't looking at something really important called emerging groundwater and preferential pathways for flooding in communities. There's no reason that water wouldn't pop up behind your seawall. There's no reason it won't pop up behind a levee. And I find myself advocating for levee improvements. I also wanna know that they're gonna work. And so I think this is a great strategy, provide early warning protective services um, for the most vulnerable communities around the state. We have you know, 17,000 parcels, you guys taught me this, of housing vulnerable in South Stockton. And we don't really have a community emergency response team like we have here in, San in Contra Costa County. We don't have anybody that's gonna like knock on people's doors and help them get out of town. So community-based organizations and hopefully state agencies will help us get to that. But so crazy small world that me and Jim are in the same presentation. So this is a great map that shows you the disproportionate vulnerability of our community. And hopefully money shows up in the same proportions um, to, to help us do things like these short-term response strategies to things like emergent pathways for groundwater. So you can see that obviously water doesn't just stop at the beach or at the shoreline, but it saturates soils and it's still, it's still mobile in those soils. You guys are all scientists, you get that. Um, and so plenty of evidence of water popping up behind uh, basic infrastructure that doesn't acknowledge that the soil is porous and things move through. Jim would do this much better than me. Um, you know, direct rain flooding that goes over the wall. Drainage backflow pushes up our systems. I'm actually doing pretty good with this. <laughs> and, and then it pops up. You know I'm doing it? Yeah. She watches me. Uh, and then it pops up in places where nobody expects it. We saw this all the time in Richmond. Uh, Richmond had an Atchison Topeka Santa Fe railway that just cut across the city and didn't recognize that Richmond's really sort of a, an alluvial fan of, of those creeks, uh, Wildcat Creek and um, San Pablo Creek. And so uh, a city with rock hard soil that's really hard to plant trees in always had this wet strip along Atchison Topeka and Santa Fe railway, so much so that folks' houses were wet and rotten all along that street. And it was really a, a terrible equity issue that uh, a gigantic railway still has tons of money from and isn't doing anything to help with the problems it left behind. Um, so Jim was always trying to get me to get my environmental justice program to work on these issues in Richmond. Um, and I always loved the idea of, you know, giving communities literacy about risks to life and limb and household and wealth, but also like not leaving them helpless, not being able to do something about it. So I may not be able to put them in a skip loader and help rebuild the levee, but I can develop community monitoring strategies, especially with the new wave of you know, the drop in prices of low cost remote sensors uh, and the amazing amount of technical people that wanna help with projects like this and teach me to say things that I don't really understand. Um, so you can see here uh, some, of the, some of the evidence metrics for, for emergent groundwater popping up uh, in, a, in a regular city. I'm pretty sure this is Atchison Village. There's a whole cooperatively owned housing development in Richmond. Everybody's got a sump pump underneath them because they're all sitting in the bottom of the bucket. Yeah, that's definitely Atchison Village. I've been underneath those. I know U.S. Maritime shot at construction when I see it. So, um, we're still making decisions on how to maintain, design, and build levees. I just got schooled on the fact that we can't plant trees in the depth because hurricanes knock them down in New Orleans. I sure would like, I sure would like to spread cottonwoods all over this place, shade the waters. Um, but you know, we have design specs that aren't relevant to this time or this place. So we need data, um, and there's, and also we need data about inundation and and subs, uh, subsidence. Um, and so there are ways to do this. Are we done? Oh, it stops going. No, I have a better, I have a better picture of this. Uh, I can describe it. Arrays of remote data loggers at different depths spread at appropriate distances can give you early warning of emergent pathways coming to the other side of levees. There's also new technology varying radio cables and levees that you can ping and, re and get and recall data from by doing drone flyovers. So there's a lot of ways for us to know these things early. And if we know these things early, we can tell people, we can help them get out of there. As Barbara's always telling me, communities of color don't, re don't recover from floods. And that's for good reason. Look at Katrina. Everybody that had $500 in their pocket or $1,000 in their bank account, they got out of town. They got a hotel. They sat there and they got out a pencil and paper and said, 
What do we need from the house? Where's our insurance policy? Who are we gonna stay with? Where do we go? If you're a black resident and you're sitting on an overpass and LAPD shooting at you, you don't have time to, play, to plan. Right? You don't have time to get ready to get back to your home. And so uh, when the crisis has passed, uh, that history of white wealth and that head start that we have in capacity and relationships to public agencies allows white folks to come back easier than everyone else. And this is a great example of how environmental contingency uh, hits communities unequally in a single discrete event. So we can warn them. At the very least, we can inform them. And then I should share that the other panelist who is going to be here has a brilliant idea that I love, which is a low cost, maybe no cost for some people insurance policy. It has people in super vulnerable places getting a cash wire when we hit a certain threshold so that they can get out of town. They can take their family somewhere. They can get a pencil and a piece of paper and do some planning. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm frustrated with with California climate resilience stuff is um, we all get pushed through the same cost benefit analysis, you know, no matter how lofty and how beautiful the poetry is of your enabling legislation whatever they want us to do from the Strategic Growth Council, uh, the unhealthy relationship between a man in the Department of Finance and his economics professor from 1978 is going to tell you what you're allowed to do, right? And so cost-benefit analysis uh, failed to appreciate that low-income communities of color, uh, it's more expensive to do stuff there, right? So I'm, when I'm in Richmond planting a tree, I got to replace a sidewalk. I got to talk to somebody with not enough money to pay for a gardener into accepting a tree. Berkeley's got a whole staff of people. So when they submit their proposal for an urban forestry project, they're just buying trees, right? They're giving a guy on the clock who's skilled in the community with infrastructure that works money for trees. I got to hire staff that don't know anything about it, train them to operate it, address the gray infrastructure that was built racistly in the first place, and then I get to buy trees. And then I get to argue with the city about whether or not they should be maintaining their trees. Mm -hmm. South Stockton, I got sidewalks from 1936, 1942. The TCC project, it's a tough climb. Um, and so this agency, and you know, actually all California agencies have all the authority they need to aggressively address racial inequality, historic inequality. Look up your government code 11135. Every time you touch federal dollars, look at Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. You have tons of authority to do things outside of your normal authorizations to address this history. You just can't keep playing dumb about it. Um, and, and doing you know, radically inclusive equity strategies for these communities is the right thing to do. It'll also save you money, save you time, and maybe you'll sleep better. So uh, I think um, now it's time for some Q&A. And I think that you know, my, my request is to maybe talk about um, sort of the urgent health protective strategies that haven't occurred to this like failed substitute teacher who doesn't know a lot about flooding. Uh, and then to um, you know, have Myla help me field some of these questions should they range into the technical realm. Um, so I don't know if I've triggered any questions um, or if everybody's really sad now. <laughs> <laughs> like we all want to talk. I think it is the same. But at least, you know, at least we're not all going to leave here and play dumb, right? We're pretty short on time, but like, yeah. does anyone have a question? Maybe one question. Does anybody have insights as to how a Delta community without planning assistance from public agencies can engage with the adaptation planning of the Stewardship Council and other Delta agencies? Like, how do, how do we steer the money to the people that don't have time to come fight for it? You gonna do that for me? You gonna help me do it? That's a, that's a generative question. I don't think we really need to answer that. <laughs> Maybe you maybe leave with it. Yeah. So it's more of a, just kind of a comment to sort of answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, this is not, this is my field. I, you know, I work in my little, mm -hmm. little thing, but the, the thing that you brought up about, you know, the tree concept mm -hmm. of how hard it is to do some things in some communities versus others. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of the grants now are trying to give like more points they for, do. For that, but then what you're saying, sometimes. you might get some more points, but then you're saying it's cost more money too. Yeah. And so maybe you're not as competitive for the grant, right? Yeah. Or, or and the limit stays the same, right? It's right. Still a $500, exactly. Dollar Cal Fire grant. Right. They give me 25%, they bump it up to 50, 
I just don't know why it's not 100%. And, and, and so these are things that I think are really, they are really hard for our grant programs to recognize and to work, um, oh, you know, work around, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I know that like, even with the pandemic, when there were, you know, when there were, uh, there were money, there were monies available, you had some of the more, the groups that you wouldn't think really needed it, they really got the money because they didn't have the grant writers or the, or the people applying and everything. And so, I mean, this is a huge, this is a problem that happens across the board, right? Yep. And so, so having groups like your group that offer help is, is you're really filling a gap. Yeah. And, and so it seems like what we need to do at the state level is try to encourage more of those sorts of efforts and more, and more of these grants that can help small nonprofits help these communities rise up, which you is what you're doing. That or, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. yeah. There's also a requirement that people like ours have to have a program that you stop. We had to go raise the money with other funders or through donations to front the whole program. We're still waiting for reimbursement for a Cal EPA grant. So this is a, it's a real serious problem because 16 years in this, great staff, I'm always four months away from not making it all the time, okay? Because there is not equal infrastructure investment. There aren't reserves built into CBOs that are doing the work in struggling communities. So um, it's a huge issue. Uh, the, how you get the funding is unequal. Uh, having the resources to get the funding, uh, it means that uh, people like me uh, wear seven hats at the right. same time, you know, and you can only do that for so long. Right. And um, then the payment is always delayed. By the time it comes in, it already yeah. costs more. So yeah, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a resilient strategy to have Barbara rob time from her family to provide equal protection to California residents. And what I just want to finish with her question is, yeah, you do need to work with us, you do need to empower us, and you do need to resource us, and you need to plan to push us out, right? You don't want me doing this forever. It's the government's job to do the government's work, and I'm just helping you be more literate on it. So please make me less necessary. Sorry, add to that. No, right. And and Matt and I are good. Good cop, bad cop, social scientists learning, you know, science and scientists right, learning awesome. social scientists. So Delta Stewardship Council, in addition to the 250 page, you know, final report, don't forget to read the addendum on community engagement, and environmental justice, which also is in NEPA and is in CEQA. So like Matt's saying, it's in the code, but it's usually just a checkbox, but let's really implement that and, and agencies with their grant programs are finally getting woke to Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. I used to be an Army Corps um, regulator at SPN. I used to work for Caltrans as a biologist. So I've seen those boxes, but you know, I'd rather do this work because it's more fun for me. Um, but to inform you know, the, the, the CBOs, like what their rights are and fight for that money that the agencies are finally getting woke to and giving us extra points on. But that's just starting. Yeah, yeah. it's I, just I'll starting. wrap this up because I know we have to go. I mean, how many people get to have a technically proficient person come work for you for less than their worth? Right. So we have that. We're really lucky. Um, we didn't have that when we had to fight COVID. When our county board of supervisors wanted to curry votes, so they gave all the money to the American Legion of Honor, a whites only veterans organization. So we had a 90% whites only va vaccination rate in the most diverse city in America. So a history worker, a filmmaker, wh what do we call Nate? Nate Nate's a creative. Uh, and, and, and his wife, Amy, who's, who's brilliant, had to figure out how to deliver COVID vaccinations in South Stockton. And so that was terrible. And I'll just say we kicked ass and we beat the state average on getting vaccinations up. But that lesson, you know, the takeaway from the pandemic should be that uh, inequality isn't just bad for vulnerable, poor people. It's a threat to everybody. And on a bad day with flooding the Delta and we're all in a FEMA trailer, your food's not showing up, your water's not showing up either. Um, you know, history is rife with examples uh, of how that turns bad. Thank you. We all like you
All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Myla. Um, with that, we have our closing remarks from Martina. Thank you, everyone, for staying on. Hope you enjoy the food. Um, I got a, a log in my name. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, what an afternoon. That's it. You know, I mean, that's it. Thank you for staying till the end and participating. Um, yeah, it has been pretty powerful and amazing afternoon, actually. So much uh, expertise and knowledge and so much passion. And so I enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. Uh, I want to thank you also the regional parks for, uh, for accommodating us and the facility and um, giving us the tour. Uh, thank you for uh, Chair uh, Virginia Medienu for providing the snack, the refreshments. Uh, we will uh, we will be circulating some evaluation, I believe, in a couple in a few days or a week. We're gonna hear feedback from you. This has been a some of like some of the pilot workshop. Uh, I think um, I hope we will be able to do it again, maybe in two years, kind of see how much has perhaps changed, what has been you know accomplished and maybe kind of providing those opportunities again. I think one of the things that we heard, we heard it today also like kind of involving youth uh, and you know, maybe being part of this, um, this discussion, some kind of educating them as well. We, we are not able to do it this time, but maybe we have a chance to do it again. It's something you would like to incorporate. So yeah, we will look for your, uh, forward for your feedback, how, how we done and how to improve it. And uh, I hope some of the partnerships will continue, you know, kind of working together and uh, yeah. Lots of kind of difficult, complex issues. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, the journey will, will continue. And I hope this workshop and the work that kind of led up to that will, you know, uh, create its, these, these connections that will kind of hopefully make some difference and be able to find some uh, complex, you know, the, the solution to those complex issues. So again, thank you very much for coming. Um, I think we are skipping the meet and greet. I hope people get a chance to kind of talk to each other, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Today's probably somewhat food in the bag. So uh thanks again and yeah, have a great Martina, would you like me to end the recording? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank thanks, you, Eric. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Good Thank you. Have thanks everyone for watching. How's it going? I gotta log up, Matt. Oh, okay. email. So we